Welcome to episode 49 of the Paropod. We're back in full HD audio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good to be. It's great to hear the sound of our own voices properly. Well, we heard it last week, but it was different. You know, different, yeah. different circumstances. You, that was the, the audience wasn't hearing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was devastating, though. You know, we we recover that. I think absolutely. I think hybrid. the audience will agree that we recover that. But um, yeah, it's good to be here. How are you getting on? I'm good. I'm very good. Watched a few movies this week, you know yourself. Went to ah, Hout yeah. on the weekend. Same, same. Mm. Went to Hout. Got absolutely butchered. Butchered by the rocks. No one told me that the rocks were like like razor sharp down there. Yeah, man. It's off that, yeah, the Stone Beach. Yeah, the Stone Beach, yeah. Oh, what day were you there? Sunday. I was there on the Saturday, right? Mm. And we we started off at the small, like, uh, not even the small beach, like the Hout Beach, the one that, right beside the Tide Station. Mm. And we were there for a while, and, like, the tide was still in, so, like, the beach was tiny, and we're like, ah, here, we'll just move to the other beach, and we went to the other beach, and because the tide was in, grand to, f- to go in the water. Mm. Later on, tide went out, feet got fucking destroyed going into that water then. Which one was that? Was that the Burrow Beach, or um, the one, like, you know, in Hoth? You know, the, the one that you have to go, the one that you have to go up, uh, and the then hill, down steps. And then down all yeah, the steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Uh-huh. That thing's that thing's not even a beach. That's just like that's just rocks. Yeah, no. There's like there's like one small patch of sand, and there's like it was like there's loads of families there. It's like I'm not but gonna, it's it's I'm okay to sit that. on the to sit on the rocks. Though. Oh yeah, yeah. It is really comfy enough. Yeah, yeah. It's just but you're, if you're walking down, like even the walk down fucks with your feet. Yeah, no. And then you get into the water, and it's way worse. And yeah. it's like you don't know where you got because like, there's like rocks underneath the water as well, and it's like it doesn't really level out. There's no sand until like twenty meters out. Oh man, I'd see it keep going, honestly. Because when I, because people were swimming when the tide was in, people were swimming out to this this boy that was like, yeah, a good bit out, right? Mm. Or like a decent bit. Out. I don't know how far out, like let's say twenty meters out, or whatever. Mm. But like when the tide went, when the tide went out, then the tide was in. Then when the tide went out, like I got into the water and I like had to walk fucking ages to actually get into the water, and then I could walk and still be within my depth up until that boy. Oh really? And like the fucking, I was what just time like, was that? about like six o'clock. But Jesus, man, like the fucking, like it, it has such a steep uh, like decline, mm. and then it just levels out for fucking ages. Yeah, it's good for a beach. Mm. Good for a beach. Plenty of room to swim and stuff. Because I, I hate when I can't touch the ground. Yeah, same. I don't know? like it either. Like I can swim, but I don't like not knowing that like. Uh, especially there's like space beneath me. Well, especially you, know? you have to swim in there, and uh, like I, I couldn't properly swim because yeah, I mean, hit my feet off the ground like yeah, off exactly, rocks yeah. that were just sticking up. Yeah, I was trying to stand up, and it's like yeah. suddenly the, the 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 ground has moved up a meter, and I'm just scraping <laughs> my knees. You know, it was it was disgraceful. I, I hadn't been in the sea in, in quite a long time. Yeah, same. It's so. been ages. Yeah, it was great. Felt amazing. It was great. It's great when you get out and like you lick your lips, and it's like mm. salt, salty. It's Man, great. you get like. <laughs> Because uh, at the start, obviously, it's fucking freezing. But once you get your head underneath the water and you're in there for a little bit, it's grand. It's yeah. grand. Yeah, it's worse to get out. Yeah, yeah it, it is worse to get out. Yeah, I'm. All, I'm always proud about leaving my stuff on the beach. Yeah, same. I don't like. Doing I don't that like either. that. But there was a guy beside us, and he was like on his own, and he went down. And he was like, "Oh, do you mind looking looking after my stuff?" We're like, "Yeah, of course." And then he came back, and he's about to leave. We we're like, we we're going down. He's like, "I'll wait. I'll wait and watch your stuff." And like, I was like, "You're a fucking king. You're a king. legend. You are a king of the people." Mm-hmm. You know, I love that guy. Sound, that is proper sound. Yeah, that's dead on. Like, you that's what to do it. Because I'm always thinking that, like, I'd love to go by myself if, like, you know, like after work or something like that. It's like a lovely day, especially mm. like past few weeks. It's like, oh, I'd love to go to the beach, but like, first of all, it's like so much effort. But also, it's if you're getting to any beach in Dublin is a fucking effort. Yeah, thing. yeah. But also, like, if you're on your own, I'd I'd always be like looking back at my stuff. You yeah. Know? I'd be like, oh, no one's watching it. You know. I so, don't know how those cunts do when they go off to Dolly Mount and they just swim. Yeah, yeah. I don't know mm. how you do that. Yeah, I, I don't get that. Dolly Mount is just like, I, I just, apparently that's a really nice beach in some parts, but I, I just imagine it as like the fucking gravel, grey gravel and then mm. like fucking sludge water and stuff. Not my vibe. Same. That's what I picture it as yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, I'm only there, I'm only there for walks in the evening though. Really. I'm only ever there at that time. Oh, really? And the fucking tide goes way out there. Jesus, the tide goes out so far in Dolly Mount. Yeah, the tide's mad. Yeah, the, the tide's moon. crazy, The moon. Man. The oh, moon. What's that about? How's the moon doing? I don't know. Dragging on the or some dragging shit. on the sea, you know. What's that about? Gravity is fucking bizarre. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's still a mystery. They still don't know what, how it works. Just big things they floating about, and yeah, they don't get it. They're like, why? Why is it so powerful? But it's also the weakest thing. You know, yeah, One of those things. It's yeah. weird. Yeah, sure. but like even like the fact that it, like it affects time as well. Yeah, yeah. What's like that it about? Pulls in time. How does that make any sense? That makes sense. Yeah. It just means that time is a time is space. Yeah, time and space. Yeah, the same thing. Is it the same thing? Yeah, space time. 
Space time. Space time continuum, man. Uh, what's that from? It's just every sp- every time That's travel thing. Ev- yeah, ever. it's the space time continuum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Star Trek or something. I don't know. You know, Star Wars, maybe uh, Toy Story or something. You know, mm. to infinity and beyond. But no, yeah, it's space time, sp- time and space is the same thing. You know, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I was just thinking about like you know the way that like Earth is like slowly. Like falling into the <laughs> sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the, you know the way the earth is just, you know, <laughs> rapidly falling into the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, but like, does that mean like from a? So there's a way that. Well, yeah, that means that there's somewhere. It's not a stable orbit, no. I thought. Are we falling into the sun? I yeah, everything just, around uh, the sun is falling into the sun. Is it? Are we not just gonna get absorbed by it though? It's gonna like shit the bed and then it'll expand. Well, that's if you don't hit it first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Either um, or, we're fucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, like, that's billions and billions and billions and billions of years down the line or whatever. It was, like, four billion years, yeah. But, like, what I was thinking of is... But it's so obvious now that I think about it. From, from You could go somewhere and then come back and, like, a second has gone by and, like, Earth has fallen into the sun. Like, it's already gone. Yeah, like, if you travel at light speed. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's so weird, though, you know? Because mm. you, you could travel to the nearest star if you do it instantaneously... It's four light years away. Alpha Centauri, I think it is. And then you get back. It's another four light years. Eight years have passed. Yeah. But to you, it could only be two seconds. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. You know, eight years. Or if you go to a, like a more distant star, it's like the, the, like the furthest, 13 billion light years away. You come back. It's like, lads, what happened? You know, mm. 26 billion years have passed. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Earth? You know? What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. But to you, it's like nothing. Well, no, when when you go, like if you're if something's eight light years away, that means you have to travel eight years at the speed oh, of light. Yeah, yeah. Which fucking means it's even fucking further. Wait, f- wait, how does it work then? So wait, eight bit wait. So wait, four light years away, say the nearest star. So that's eight years uh full voyage. Full but, voyage but what, at the speed of light. But what's happened here? Is it not it's the same here, isn't it? Time's just passed. So what's the time dilation thing? How's that come into it? Where are we I think g- it think is it something you have to move faster than the speed of light or something? That's not possible though, is it? I thought well, we don't know. That's what we know at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. There could be something out there that probably... Well, you can fold it. Warp drive. Fold it space time. Like a sheet of paper. But that's not faster, though. That's just, like, closing the gap mm. between space. I don't know. don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's beyond our, our, our the scope of our yeah, knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time, <laughs> dilation. <laughs> time dilation. Time <laughs> dilation, speed of light. I have no idea. I, just I don't know, man. Isn't it Neil deGrasse Tyson every so often? Yeah, like, I just watch his TikTok. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah what, even, what even looking at this week? Um, I watched The Matrix this week. Oh shit, that makes sense. Yep. Here we go. It's shit, time, it's time. You took man. the red pill. Ah, uh, red pill out of it, man. You got red pill to bits by The Matrix. Yeah. By Honestly. the Wachowskis. <laughs> by the Wachowskis. Mm. You see, there's a new one coming out. Yeah, this, this year. year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What the fuck? Can't remember what it's called. I think mm. it's called Mat- Matrix Evolution or something like that. Yeah, that's a terrible title. But the two, the, man, I love like what is it? The Matrix, Matrix Reloaded. Yeah, yeah. And then Matrix Revolution. Revolution. I think. Matrix Reloaded perfect title yeah yeah it's just like you just imagine a gun you know I've never seen any of the other Matrixes Matrix you guys <laughs> Ma- yeah what's the plural of that yeah, yeah uh, apparently they're rubbish apparently apparently they're shy especially the third one I remember seeing nothing about the. Ma- I remember seeing the Matrix 1 when I was younger and then seeing Matrix uh, like Revolutions or whatever the fuck it's called Revelations Revelations <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> whatever the fuck it's called yeah. Um, the third Matrix movie and just seeing like a guy in a mech suit, like f- Gatling gunning, like all these like spider robots that were coming after him. I was like, "What? <laughs> yeah, what? Where the? I was like, what the fuck? Where did the, like? Because like because compared to that, the Matrix movie is pretty low key. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty simple concept, you know. Isn't it like it's like a rip off of a book though, isn't it? I don't know. The Neuromancer. I, I think have it no is. idea. By Neil Stevenson, I believe, or no, William Gibson. I think it is. It's like the same kind of concept of, you know, a Matrix or like a cyber... It's like cyberpunk, Yeah, isn't it? Cyberpunk is fuck. Yeah, yeah. But has Keanu Reeves in it, Lawrence Fishburne. They're all coming back as well this year. Yeah, I know. They're all back what in it. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. But, what, but it's only one of the Wachowskis is doing it now. Oh, is it? Yeah, one of them dropped is out. Is it Lily or Lana? I think L- I think it's Lana. I think mm. I think Lily dropped out or something for some reason. But it's like it's not like a feud. Or th- mm. I think it's just like she's doing it because she had an idea or something yeah, like that. Something I don't like know. That. We'll see. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun. But yeah. The Matrix. Yeah, The Matrix. Yeah, what's the premise of The Matrix? So for those of you that don't know, <laughs> yeah. The Matrix is about Neo. Um, Neo? 
Neo. It's about Neo. <laughs> <laughs> um, Neo, the one. <laughs> like He's the chosen one. Getting woke. Oh, shit. Unlocking his inner abilities within mm. the Matrix, whatever. Um, we all know the Matrix. But, like, you know, watching it now and, you know, being a little bit older and, you know, understanding that films can be talking about things. I kind of enjoyed the Matrix a little bit less now because, of like, <laughs> Jesus, this film is so fucking preachy. Like, it's really What's preachy. What's it preachy about? Like there's a moment it's not even so like at all. It's just like there's one there's a bit where like they're walking in the street mm. and it's um it's when the, the red dress girl comes into it. Do you remember that bit that bit where like he's just like always keep your eyes open on everyone. Anyone could be an agent and he's like, Look ah. like did she distract you? And then he turns around and Agent Smith's there with a gun and said. Ah. But like before that they're like walking in the mat- or in the training simulation and Morpheus is talking about like all the people that are around and he's just like, he basically says at one stage, like, anyone that's not with us is against us. And Neo, like, looks at a cop who's just, like, <laughs> like jotting down something yeah. and, like, st- stares back at Neo, like, menace, menace, evilly. <laughs> yeah, evil, like. Um, and I was like, oh, wow, it's, like, n- it's not subtle at all. But, like, I'm, a, like, I am What's he trying to say? He hates cops? Hate the it's system? Just the system, bro. We've got to tear yeah. the system down. Wake up. Like, Wake you know, up, yeah. They're, 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 you know, it's like, yeah. You know, it's the Matrix. Like, they're keeping you neutral, not keeping you active. They're suppressing you. They're keeping you asleep in those pods. Yeah. Wake up, bro. <laughs> yeah, wake up. Take the red pill. Take the red pill and wake mm-hmm. up. Exactly. That's in this one, isn't it? That is this That's one, yeah. Things, like, yeah. Just like, he's holding his hands out. Choose the blue pill. <laughs> you wake up. What if I told you everything you know is, like, you know, not real or whatever? It's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you know, it's that's okay. Like, I'm okay with the Matrix, like, not being subtle. Because it's not subtle at all. One of the main villains in this film, who is played by fucking Ralphie from The Sopranos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in this. Man, he, he's great. He's a great actor. He plays the guy that, like, stabs in the back mm. and, like, kills a few of them. His name is Reagan. In this? In this. Ah, oh, that's not very subtle yeah. at all, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, straight up Reagan. Jeez. Yeah, he's a, he's great. He's, he's great, great little villain. He's a great actor. Yeah, yeah. But again, he, like, he l- he's like always a, a sniveling little shit. Yeah, he has that kind of voice. And yeah. in that face. Yeah, the face. He's the face that. of a fucking rat, basically. Yeah, his head's all like spherical. <laughs> but I know? forgot that like this was this came out before he was in Sopranos. Oh yeah, which 99. is like pff, crazy. Back in the day, Sopranos. Like ever ever look at like Sopranos like season one stuff like that. After watching the end of it. Sort of this, it's time dilation. Yeah, you know? like oh my god, this is this is the nineties. You know, transported back to nineteen ninety nine. Nineteen ninety nine. What a year, you know. But like e- then with the Matrix as well, the whole like just Morpheus as a character, like the <laughs> lines he comes out with <laughs> are just ludicrous now. Like it's so fucking cheesy, mm. and the costumes, like everyone knows what the Matrix looks like. Yeah, and like like back in I'm sure back in nineteen ninety nine, coolest shit ever. Now. It's a vibe that you have to like adjust to, and you have to like you have to get on board with the Matrix because it's got a bit of chunk to it, and like yeah. it's not it's not very like sleek and slender like you remember it being, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like but was that when was Columbine or Columbine whatever you call it? I think it's nineteen ninety nine. They literally, but they wear the same outfits like. Yeah, man, it's so a cool weird. vibe. It's a cool vibe, you know, the, the long leather things. What you call it? Waistcoats. Waistcoats, yeah. Or, uh, trench coats. Trench, trench coats. coats, yeah. The trench coats. Wearing leather waistcoats. Maybe that's the, but I, the new this, one. The whole thing is like, a, it's a vibe you have to, it's just you have to get on board with. Kind of kind of campy. It take, it's a, yeah, it's campy as fuck. Yeah. It's camp. Camp. It's camp Camp now. city, yeah. But yeah, like, now. But at the time, it's like, camp. whoa. It's like, yeah, it's all the music and all. Oh, the music. And yeah. even like the special effects. Obviously, the special effects don't really hold up that well. Yeah, the scene where he's like, Dodging the bullets. That's in this one, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's still, but like, it's that more never so looked good, really. But, but like, it's, it was a cool concept. It's more so the, the like explosion, <laughs> in it. I wouldn't say. Do you remember the explosion when they're breaking into the, up to save Morpheus? All oh, right. And um, some of the slow mo, doesn't look great. Mm. Doesn't look great. But you know that's like, that's expected. I I like the Matrix is still a blast. It's still so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hugely influential, you know. Mm. Just b- even beyond films, you know. Insane. Yeah, insane stuff. Even the red pill thing. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, Taking on fuck? huge, completely divorced from the meaning, the original meaning. Well, not divorced from the meaning, but, but, like, but from, like, like, the original kind of setting that it But the thing is, is that, like, from. like, being red pill is being, like, right wing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, like, the f- the weird thing is, like, you, like, fundamentally 
misunderstand the Matrix then. Well, they just re- they they intentionally misinterpret it. Oh man, I don't know because like because yeah, it's, it, obviously the film doesn't advance that, but you could. It's like the film doesn't have a very set message in that way. It's just kind of like anti-authoritarian. Yeah, it? You know, which right? is which, what it is. Which can be like, oh, that means that you know you should be right wing or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the whole thing of like get, like waking up from like the reality that you live in, Getting bro. Woke, yeah, and that yeah. reality can be whatever. Same way that like people read into the Matrix now and like, oh, the Wachowskis, it's a it's a trans allegory. Yeah, yeah. Even though that they've said like, no, we made this with an intent. Like we mm. were talking about something very explicitly. Like it's very <laughs> obvious in the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, even what, like deliberately misinterpreting it. Yeah. yeah, which is just crazy. Or even like the fact that like like when right wing is like, oh man, we're living in the Matrix. We're living in nineteen eighty four. It's like. But like that's like the very different things as well, because like the Matrix is like a system of control, you know. Mm. It's more like Brave New World. It know? is very, very like Brave New World. They're like, but they're very different things, you know. Nineteen eighty four, I don't know. Yeah, they're more about that, aren't they? You know, because the Matrix thing is like, oh, uh, that's more like a QAnon kind of thing, you know. It's like, oh, wake up! It's like it's a, it's like a secret society, it's like mm. a different level of existence, yeah. different level of like a uh, mentality or something like that. QAnon is actually terrifying. They're hilarious, man. They, I they just are, find that. They're it's funny, man. But then you see, like, the fucking protests in Dublin, and they're shouting, like, Michael Higgins is a pedo, and it's like, that's just QAnon bullshit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of the stuff they come out with. Like, get you, like if you're going to be, if you're going to start being conspiracy theories, stop taking away, stop, come up with something yourself. Like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> come up with something original, something uh, unique to this island. You can't be robbing American conspiracy theories, calling everyone a pedo. Yeah. See, they had a, they had a pretty big rally there. Yeah, right? massive rally, man. Yeah, fucked up. That's yeah. so embarrassing that anyone went to that. I'm so embarrassed for yeah. anyone, anyone who even shares that stuff on Facebook. It's oh, embarrassing. man, at this stage, it's like, Jesus. Yeah, it's bleak. But that's the thing. These people are, like, so disconnected from reality that they're not really a threat. They don't exist in this, in, this, in the same plane of existence as us. But the other thing as well is that, like, they don't shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> That's the thing. It's a cult. Yeah. It's a cult setup. You know, it's a cult system. Like, isn't it classified as a cult now? QAnon in, sure in the US. Because that's pretty much what it is. That, that Q fella. I watch all those documentaries and work. They always come up. Uh, I don't watch them in full, but like, I get the lore now. I understand more of the lore <laughs> behind it. The whole Q thing. Mm. And uh, What is Q? He's a guy. He's an anonymous poster on a uh, like 4chan. Or one of them. And uh, he claimed to be an insider in the White House. And his his uh he built up this mythos and it involved Clinton and Epstein and all this stuff and um talking about a, a child sex ring in Hollywood and in DC and like the elites of America and how hey, tr- Gate now. yeah and how Trump he, yeah he basically like like pulled together all these like sort of different conspiracy theories and created like sort of consolidated consolidated them into one one kind of movement and he said that Trump was the chosen one like literally in like a religious sense to bring it all down Trump was Neo. Trump, yeah, Trump was Neo. Yeah. And, like, it wasn't as if, he wasn't, like, I was watching one of the videos, and it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like, oh, Trump is a, is a fucking, he's the savior or whatever. It's like, he's been chosen by something else, by, like, some yeah. greater power. And, like, either you get behind him, like, he's not perfect, either you get behind him, or you're on their side. Like, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yeah. If you're not with Trump, you're against, you know, children or whatever, or, like, Western society mm. and stuff like that. Absolutely flat out insane, you know. Yeah, I know. But it, like, no one knows who he is anyway. It's like, like CIA or some shit. <laughs> ah, definitely CIA. Like, <laughs> absolutely, all that stuff, like the riots and stuff they have in little rallies, that has CIA written all over. Like, mm. as a, but it's not as, even as if like he has a blog or anything. It's just random posts on anonymous message boards, and it's like signed Q, and they're like, oh, that's him. Like, no way to verify, but yeah. like, that's that's probably him. You know, <laughs> it's so silly. But that's the thing. It's like it's just. It's uh so devo- yeah the matrix is so devoid yeah kind of kind of context yeah kind of taking all these uh different stories different allegories so uh, we talked about a fucking uh feels good man ages back yeah yeah like that's the same thing there as well yeah quite similar yeah just taking it and just transforming it into something else yeah that's the thing yeah we have to accept that's that's, that's gonna happen you know you have to you have to fight back against it mm. you have to have uh, new stories but what I don't even understand about like like the matrix as well as like the whole red pill thing like when i was watching it's like oh they probably mean like you know red like yeah russia or something like that or yeah. like communism you know <laughs> communist red as opposed to republican red <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's one of those things you know blue pill to fuck you know blue pill you're blue pill bro you don't get it you don't get it bro you're cooked and blue pilled you're bleeding soy boy <laughs> mm. you're such a beta male yeah such a diverse lingo there mm. 
you know? It's just the same thing over and over again, just through different words. Well, that's that's kind of what the internet is, isn't it? You know, the Matrix. Yeah. Pretty much. Ones and zeros. <laughs> yeah, ones and zeros and stuff, and, like, you wake up, and, like, you plug into it. It's just a very relevant film. Mm, it is, and it's, like, a universal story as well. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just anti-authoritarian. Yeah, the people love that. Yeah. Be- the people love it. The people do be loving those stories. Do the people love First Cow? The people absolutely adored First Cow. Mm. It was apparently the best film of either 2019 or 2020. I think it came out in 2019. But it was widely released in 2020. So it was, it was on like... I think it was the Sight and Sound had it as, mm. the, as the best film of 2020. Or one of those lists. Um, it was like top. It was first. And uh, it's on movie now. Yep. It's been on movie since July or something. 19th. And uh, it came up with my recommended, and I was like, ah, Kelly Reichardt. I've been to watch her films mm. for a while. I've heard a lot, a lot of good things about her. Um, she did uh, some other films I can't remember. <laughs> 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 but she's like a really kind of uh, kind of vibey director, mm. like transcendental. I was kind of following on from... Uh, Tokyo Story? Yeah, that thing we were doing the other week. Um, just kind of like that idea of a film that like sort of lingers, mm-hmm. that lets it linger, that lets... Let scenes breathe and characters breathe, uh, and that's what this film is. Very, very slow and boring, <laughs> extremely boring. But in like a you know like we're one with nature kind mm-hmm. of thing. Cause it's about this. St- it's been set in the eighteen twenties in America in the Oregon Territory, back before they were like they'd made everything into a state. Mm-hmm. And it follows these guys, Cookie and King Lou. King uh, Lou. King Lou. He's a like Chinese immigrant. All oh, right. So it's, just, it's King Lou. It's not like the king. He's just that's his name. Mm. And um, they're just like sort of, they're just kind of there, you know. They're like fucking trappers, mm-hmm. and they're like uh, at this this settlement, this uh, trapping settlement that sort of focused around beavers and dams and stuff like that. And uh, they get wind of uh, this cow has been imported, the first cow in the territory. Uh, but it's it's mate and it's calf died on the way in, so it's just this, it's just it's the first cow, mm-hmm. and it's just a single cow. Um, uh, but obviously, like they're pioneers, they're on the frontier, they're not living a great life. Their bread is just flour and water, and just like you know, they're just barely getting by. And so they decide to uh, steal milk from the cow, and they they see the cow in like the pastures or whatever, just like sort of floating around the forest, mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, love some milk. So they run over and start pulling on the tits. Get a big bucket of milk, and they start making biscuits, uh, and start making all these like sort of sweet confectioners, um, and obviously that's like a, it's like a luxury, it's like a treat, which they you know they're not used to at all because very harsh life life mm-hmm. that they live, um, so uh, King Lou comes up with the idea to start selling it in the town in like the sort of fucking little market square thing they have, and they make a mint, they make a mint, and they come they become famous because the guy Cookie is is also a baker, uh, and he's really good at really good at his job. And the, the guy who owns the land and owns the cow is a guy called... He's ca- referred to as the chief factor, uh, which was a title. It was someone who sort of like oversaw... The chief factor. Chief factor, yeah. It's such a strange title. It's actually a thing. It used to be a thing. It was like he over, sort of oversaw trade and stuff like that. Mm. And sort of uh, acted as like an, an intermediary between different parties. And in this, I think he owns the land and the cow. He's this English fella from London. And he's all proper and like uptight and like prim and stuff like that. Uh, he's always talking about London. Um, he's like preoccupied with uh, like fashion trends mm. in Paris, um, because he's, he's there's a scene where he's discussing with like the chief or whatever, like one of the Native Americans in the local area, and he's like, "Oh yeah, beaver is out of fashion these days. Like the people people of Paris aren't wearing beaver anymore." But um, the chief is just like, "Who gives a rat's space?" He's like, yeah. "Who gives a shit?" It's like beaver's. G- Beaver's good. Yeah. He's like, and he's like, oh, I don't understand why you white men don't eat the tail. The tail is the best part of the beaver and stuff like that. But he only sees it, like the chief factor only sees it as... A fashion thing. As, yeah, textiles to import or to export off to, to faraway lands that like no one, that no one who he knows will ever go to, mm-hmm. you know? But uh, he gets wind of these lads who are making uh, these little, little bread biscuits and he loves it obviously as well. He's like, oh, it reminds me of London. And he's like, oh, can you make me, um, I don't know what the fuck it's called. It's like a certain type of, of, of cake to bring to his gaff and then to give it to like um, some fucking English official mm-hmm. who's, who's like staying in his house because uh, he wants to like show him up, like to humiliate him. He's like, oh, I've like, I've all these, these great things, these great servants. I've, I, I live in luxury or something like that. You mm-hmm. know? Um, but the whole thing is like, he's so sort of caught up with the the objectified 
sort of a uh, image of what's mm-hmm. around him. Like he only cares about things. Like he's a very utilitarian kind of capitalist figure. Yeah. Like he has a discussion before Cookie arrives with the with the bread, with the cake, uh, at the gaff. He's discussing with the uh, other English fellow. And he's uh, they're talking about calculations and like uh punishments to be doled out to on a ship where where there's been a mutiny or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the other English guy's like, Oh, um twenty lashings should do and he's like, No, no, like sometimes you have to make an example and uh, the like the the labor that you lose and the person you punish will be made up for in the labor you gain from the people who are afraid mm-hmm. of what they've seen. As this whole sort of discussion. Jesus, that is so fucking grim. Yeah, it's like a uh, paths of glory. The yeah. last paths of glory thing is like a whole decimation sort of idea. Um, but they have this whole discussion about the calculation of labor involved in something like uh, lashing someone. Mm-hmm. And he has this this uh, quote where he says he has a line where he says um, any any problem. That can't be calc or any question that can't be calculated isn't worth asking. So it's very like really on the nose utilitarian mm-hmm. kind of like uh, Dickensian kind of thing, where it's like he's just like a oh, this, you know sort of gruff factory owner who doesn't doesn't care about the people. He only cares about the the, the bottom profit. line, yeah, the, the profit and stuff like that. Whereas all you know, like the Native Americans, they're like, oh, it's grand, you know, it's relax. Mm-hmm. And Cookie and King Lou, they're just like. They just they just like the taste of the bread really, mm-hmm. and they they're, they're trying to get away. They're trying to just make money to to go off to buy a farm in California, um, like that's their only interest. Whereas like it's just it's contrasting, uh, someone like the chief factor who is there as an alien who doesn't really understand or really belong in the environment that he's in. Like mm-hmm. he's the only person with a proper gaff in the territory as well. He has like sort of like a manner, and everyone else lives in like huts and stuff like that, and he's contrasted against the lads. Even people like Cookie and uh, and Lou, who are just kind of part of the environment. Even the stuff they wear is like it's like like sort of uh, browns and stuff. yeah earthy kind of mm-hmm. or- organic colors, um, and they're basically living off the land for half the half the film, mm-hmm. and ha- they're, s- they're sort of possess all this kind of folk knowledge, um, and e- everything that they talk about is related to their immediate their immediate experience either within the environment that they're in or their experience in the past, like. Lou has been to like different countries and all that, and he's like talking about uh, regional differences in China, where he's from. Um, so it's all about that kind of thing. It's like, oh, yeah. like you know, be one with the land, listen to the wind, and then like uh, the Brits, you know, the fuck fucking it, Brits, fucking everything up with their calculations and their their oh, is that it? Their improvement, oh, you know, he's fucking at it because that's because that's at the dawn of that whole thing. Because you know, just as the machines getting started, the eighteen twenties, you know, just after just uh, when, the, when the matrix starts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Modernity has just uh, sort of kicked off, and you have this sort of uh, building up, this accumulation of assets of uh, of productive forces, and you see it on the frontiers and the Oregon, the Oregon Territory, or whatever the whatever it is, wherever mm. they are, just in the wilderness, basically. Which is a really interesting, really interesting. Um, period of time really interesting place you know it goes back to the whole thing space mm-hmm. time time it's the same thing because it's a very specific it's not just a specific place a very specific time where uh, all these things are happening and uh, it's an interesting kind of kind of commentary on that kind of thing and mm-hmm. uh, it's so boring yeah very yeah. very boring <laughs> film <laughs> my god I, 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 I couldn't see what was going on to be fair i didn't watch it in like amazing like the right kind of circumstance, maybe. Like I was for, for part of it, I was watching it on the bus, and like I literally could. It was just the screen's just black. I couldn't see. Jesus, man, it, what are you doing? I know, but I had I had the brightness all the way up, and then I I was home and I was watching on the TV, and it was still black. Mm. Like it was just it's just there's parts that are just extremely poorly lit, or not poorly lit. They're just really darkly lit, mm-hmm. um, which I think is like a stylistic thing. Um, but it's very very mellow, very meditative film, um, and like just it has the whole thing where the characters will sort of. Like they'll talk. It's kind. It's kind of like a uh, waiting for Godot kind of mm-hmm. thing, where the talks are kind of at each other, and like in these little aphorisms, and then they'll flow off screen. But the camera will stay, just sort of like like lingering on the yeah. the grass or whatever. And uh, there's a cool shot at the end because they get found out by your man. He realizes they're they're nicking uh, his cow's milk because <laughs> he's like, here I have this I have this cow in. I poured this cow from France, like at great cost, and it doesn't produce any milk. And then. Uh, he realizes that they're nicking the milk to make their their little cakes, <laughs> which is kind of a, I thought that was kind of an annoying thing because it's, it's such a such a, like a small, like there's no stakes yeah. really. Like they're stealing milk and stuff like that. It's like really quaint. It's like a Wes Anderson film crossed with like a Terrence Malick film or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, they're stealing milk. Woo. Yeah, I know what you, you mean. Know? Which uh, yeah. is really twee, but like 
it doesn't it's yeah, not it's, it's, it's not too twee. big a complaint really twee yeah but uh, yeah he realizes they're Nick and Milk and uh, so they have to flee and uh, things kind of go wrong and like they they uh, but they've hidden the money that they have in like a tree and Lou goes back goes back to get it and I think it's Cookie wandering around in the forest and he comes across the cow again but the cow is enclosed mm-hmm. like literally enclosed by a fence just immediately around it so I was like the enclosures you know it's like extreme re- re- like really on the nose kind of like because uh, they've obviously they found it just kind of wandering around the commons around this forest area mm-hmm. and at the end by the end of the film the cow has been enclosed into a fence area so it's like you know private property they're like the whole notion of uh, economic improvement sort of taming the wilderness dominating the land embodied in the cow yeah you know from the 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 first scene to the last sounds interesting though it's an interesting film but it's boring it's extremely boring yeah okay. yeah <laughs> yeah that's a shame it's extremely boring but it is good it's good i, I, I i'm sort of sort were you of more into this than you were like the likes of, like tokyo story and stuff like that no no like tokyo story has stuff going on like in every scene mm. this is like it'll have like 30 40 30 40 seconds of silence like every you know, ten minutes or something. Ah, uh, yeah. Where yeah, like yeah. It, there is something happening, but you have to be like I I didn't watch it properly because I didn't sit down. I feel like if you have to, if you proper sat down, and just chilled out and watched it, it's something that you could just you could click into. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a vibe you have to hop on. Right? It's a vibe you have to really commit to. I think. Yeah. But I was I was sort of confused. That I didn't get like more Oscar attention because it's a really it's that kind of film that I think would do really well. Yeah, it's strange because no one really talked about it in terms of Oscar buzz. Yeah, because it came out in the states over a year ago but it only came out here like it's it's the official release here and in the UK was like last week that's so weird so so it's kind of like disjointed I was watching a uh, a review Mark Camo did on uh, on YouTube and the comments are just full of Americans going like wow like, like you're a bit late to this train <laughs> it's like man like, we, like no one I hadn't heard of this film until mm. like two weeks ago you know but, but like it's, shut it's, up yanks yeah stupid <laughs> Americans <laughs> we, we don't know everything like you know it's an A24 film. So oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Kelly Riker, I have to watch more of I've always meant to watch her films. Mm. And it has like a little interview with her at the end of the movie um, showing. She seems like an interesting woman. Does uh, she? Yeah. <laughs> well, she seems to have some good takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's grand. It's grand. I wouldn't recommend it now. Why would you give it out of five? I'd give it out of five. Yeah. Out of five, I'd give it three and a half. Three and a half? That's three and a half. Good. See, I wouldn't recommend it because it's something, if I had a week off, I'd like... And like I had a few spare hours, I'd sit down and watch it, you know. Mm. But like if you're if you're doing things, you know, if you have things going on, it's like it's a bit of a commitment for me anyway. No, I would I wouldn't that I, is fair. I wouldn't watch it again. That's fair. That's yeah. But it's interesting. It is yeah, it sounds interesting. It's interesting. But it also yeah. sounds like it's a, it sounds it's boring. A, it's a commitment. <laughs> it's boring, man, yeah. That's a shame. That That's your look. It's about a cow. It's about you know? it's about the it's first about milking cow. a cow. It's about the first cow in the Oregon territory. It's very specific. There you go. In the eighteen twenties. It's the best part about it. Yeah, <laughs> it's so specific. <laughs> and it does exactly what it specifically sets out to do, which is very specific. Specific. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. What else do you watch? What have I been watching? I Ooh! watched The Baby. What? The Boss Baby. 1973. The oh. prequel to The Boss Baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this, this set the, the foundation stones. I tell you, this started off the baby movement. Yeah, this walked so the Boss Baby could run. Ah. Uh, by God, that baby ran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. Nominated for an Oscar as well, that film. Boss Baby. Boss Baby, oh. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. When? Uh, animated. The first one. The first one. Whoa. That's the world we live in. Anyway, The I've Baby is like a kind of exploitation movie from the 1970s. Uh-oh. Um, its premise <laughs> is about a social worker who go- who comes to a house to take care of Baby. Baby is a 21-year-old man with the mind of a, of a baby. As in, he walks around and is all fours. He wears baby clothes. He's got a big cot. And he's dubbed over with baby noises. What the fuck? It is disturbing on a level that I, like, <laughs> can't quite word right. It, it's, yeah. like, it's a very visceral, <laughs> disturbing idea and image to see. Yeah. And it goes places. And it goes places where it's just like, I, 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 I don't know about this. Like, What does it do? There's a moment 
So basically, so the pl- so right, so the plot is all it's about baby, and like he's got a, he's he's ta- he's been taken care of by his mom and his two older sisters. And uh, there's a bit where the with the whole family are out, and baby is being watched over by his babysitter, and the babysitter comes up, and like because baby's making all this noise or whatever, and it's it's awful. Like the noises in this fucking film are awful. Like they're, they're like nails on a chalkboard. Oh, just the sound of them. Just the sound of them, and yeah. like it's just everything about it. Anyway, she comes up. And baby wants out of the cot, so she lets him out. And he tries to, like, open the door, and she closes it. And then he says, like... Then she starts playing ball with him. And then he drills his head off the wall at one stage, because he goes with the ball. And then she picks him up, and she's like, are you okay, baby? And then he's, like, crying whatever. And... Basically, she ends up breastfeeding him. Uh... Yeah. That's grim. Man, it's fucking grim. Wait, why? Because he wants to be breastfed, and she just... She's, she just lets him... What the fuck? I am 100% sure that this is a fetish film. Yeah. Yeah, like... The producer of this film apparently also stars in this film as Baby. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That, yeah, this is basically just like a pervert film. Yeah, this is a dirty film for perverts. I didn't know they had those back in the... Was it 70s? 1973. Because they have them now, adult babies. This thing is on Shudder. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Shudder. That's that's where it belongs. Oh, it's a horror film. He, I, like, I don't know what else to classify it as, yeah. Just, like, what happens in it? Like, it's the, the social worker ends up... Right, okay, baby. full fucking spoilers for this film, right? Oh, no. Right. <laughs> she ends up, like, being infatuated with Baby and wanting to, like, take care of him. And, like, his family... Are, like, it becomes... Eventually becomes uh, obvious... That this isn't a man, like, you know, who has the mind of a child. This is a man forced to have the mind of a child. I.e., his, pe- his, like, his mom and his two older sisters would, like, like psychologically abuse him to force him to, like, stay at the mental age oh, of a baby. That is pretty creepy. Oh, man, that's dark. Yeah, that is really dark. It's very dark. So, anyway, social worker ends up... Uh, almost getting killed by the the tree women but she survives and she murders the shit out of them mm. and then she gets baby and she brings him back home and her mom is there to also help take care of baby this whole film is basically a bunch of women fighting over yeah a baby a grown man a grown man <laughs> in a diaper, in a diaper. <laughs> anyway <laughs> we have learned at this stage that the social worker had a husband who allegedly died in a car crash I say allegedly because allegedly. It turns out he's not dead. Oh, shit. So she brings him into a room. And she's like, go on. Say hi to your new friend. And out comes another man baby who is her husband who she has kept uh, that's similar to baby so that baby can be his playmate. And she's like, this is baby Lawrence. This is, this is your new playmate. And they start fucking playing. And then she... Gets down in between them and starts kissing the two of their heads and like hugging them and holding them. Man, it's awful. Like the the reaction that this film gets out of you is yeah. unlike anything. It is horrific. It's it's like horrifyingly cringy. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look right. Yeah, I don't know. There's yeah, there's like a base reaction there. It's like like. I don't know. There's like something like deep in like the monkey brain. Mm. So that's not right. <laughs> that's that's not right. No. <laughs> There's something. That like, ain't right. <laughs> this this should this should be illegal. <laughs> that should be. Yeah, that sounds like a porno. Man, it nearly, until the end. Like it, it easily could have been. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah. Oh man, it's fucking awful. That's so like because you know the way you have that these days, like you know adult babies mm-hmm. where they like they enjoy role playing as as babies. But like they can find each other on the internet. Like they have forums dedicated to stuff like that, where the people just enthu- internet's a dirty, dirty place. Yeah, they can <laughs> find each other. But how did they find each other in the seventies? I suppose we're making they films all went, like this. They all went to go yeah. see the baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they all had to go see the baby. Yeah, and they're like, ah, oh, fellow, finally a fellow nappy enthusiast. That's so fucked up. But man, the noises that he makes is ah. Oh. What, what noise he makes? <laughs>
like baby noises and his crying and stuff like that. Like he cries like this twenty one year old. He even looks older than twenty one. I think he's like thirty. Yeah, he looks like <laughs> forty. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he's like crying with the noises of a baby coming out of him, and it's also but it's sorry, it's also an extremely boring fucking film, mm. and it's like you know shitty like in all aspects of a film it's shitty, but the like the core concept of this film is like unnerving and like disturbing in a really really precise way that i haven't experienced before mm. yeah that is really disturbing yeah. mm-hmm. that's one of those things just stay with you i suppose if I, I don't know i haven't seen it but just looking at some of the screenshots just like because it has that creepy 70s vibes like the yeah. kind of thing you'd see on tv late at night but you wouldn't understand what it is mm-hmm. and you don't even know the name of it but it stays with you for like decades afterwards yeah that's what this film is. Yeah, because <laughs> like you, you now you know the name. The quality is terrible as well. It's super Wait, on, on Shutter. Yeah, like 480p or something. Oh, two forty. Like, it's not even like the quality. It's just like it is that seventies, like you know, TV film kind of thing. TV film, like like this didn't get the upper as to like you know, Texas Chainsaw or like <clears throat> Halloween or like uh, uh, Hills of Eyes got. Mm. Like this is the, got the quality of like B of like Toxic Avenger, you know what I mean? Ah, like, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. That's not right. But Toxic Avenger is purposely shit, whereas this yeah. one's just n- not really. Yeah, it's not on purpose. <clears throat> the baby. Yeah, that's th- that's kind of like a different kind of thing of horror, though, isn't it? Unexplored horror, I would say. Unexplored, yeah. Unexplored territories. King Car obviously makes you know it's extremely disturbing. Maybe it's an interesting take on it, you know. It is interesting to, to, to watch. plumb the depths. Like, thinking about it, yeah, well, like uh. thinking about the, the the horror in it and like the disturbingness of it is like. Would that even be possible? I don't know because I don't know, I don't know how to like. It's really hard to talk about because like it's when you watch it and you see it, you un- like you'll get like this you'll get this visceral reaction from you, yeah. but it's it's ha- it's like there's something wrong <laughs> there's something wrong and i can't quite put my finger on it there's something like, seriously wrong it shouldn't yeah. be th- this disturbing for what it is literally monkey brain reaction it's like, mm. what the fuck so that's yeah. not that's not the way it should be <clears throat> but yeah is that even possible to keep it keep someone at a mental age of that like probably not but they like the taser them and stuff like that yeah maybe yeah like, they really kick the shit out of them <laughs> you wonder if that's happened it's ever happened yeah but you have the whole case well it's like different um Gypsy Rose. Yeah. Did she not kill? She killed her mom in the end, but like, yeah, yeah. Still all this stuff beforehand, I can't. What yeah, the fuck I know is that what called? you mean. I remember. Munchausen syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But like, that, that was a horrific case of child abuse. Mm. But yeah. Gypsy Rose believed it for ages. Oh, did she? Oh, that she was like disabled. Yeah, she thought, like, she th- I don't know. I th- I'm assuming that she did. And she couldn't, she didn't walk and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure she was in a wheelchair. Like her mom convinced her that she was in a, that she couldn't walk. Yeah, that was such a weird case. Yeah, mm. that's so. So bizarre. it is possible. Yeah, it is. Like to some extent. Yeah. What maybe not. Fuck? Maybe not to the level the baby goes to. <laughs> yeah, you have to be messed up though. It's like it's the basic like negative feedback thing because like when he sta- when he tries to stand up, they tase him like D- stay down, don't yeah. ever get up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't like to. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all fucked from up. Like, f- from being a child, like he's grown up this in- his entire life like that. Yeah, stunted to bits. You know, the human brain's like fucking putty. Yeah, it is. You can <clears throat> it. it was just dangerous. It was, just, it was probably the most scary thing of all. Yeah, it is. Do you know the brains are like mushy? Like if you if if you're if a uh, you know if you ever see like a brain like a, a real life brain, um, it's been like tampered with. Like because if you took a brain out of someone's head, it just it's mush. Yeah, it's like liquid. It doesn't hold a form. It's like jelly. Mm. So how did they do it? They, like, like they put d- chemicals into it. Oh, really? Yeah. You never really see that anyway. I've never seen a brain. I've never <laughs> seen a brain either. Yeah. But if you do ever see a brain, <laughs> yeah, watch now it. you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that ain't a real brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah, fuck that. Fuck that is right. The human brain. No, thanks. No, thank you. No, thank you. Um, And then continue on from the baby. I watched another, be like, not exploitation, but like B-movie from the 70s. Or maybe it's the eighties. I can't remember when Basket Case is the film I'm talking about. I don't know when it came out. Um this is about um a man walking around with a box, a basket, and he goes around and in the basket is his uh conjoined twin who is separated from him. But the <laughs> conjoined twin is like a ghoul. Like he doesn't have any legs, he's like it's like a kind of stump thing and he's really, really strong and he goes around murdering people. That sounds really cool. 
it is. That's it's a fun. great premise. It's a lot of fun up until like the last like ten minutes, but I'll get into that in a sec. Um content warning for this conversation. We're gonna have to talk about a rape scene in a bit. So if you don't uh, listen, not again. skip ahead. But so basket case is a lot of fun. Uh like the kills and stuff like that, cheesy, good gore. Just a kind of inherently insane concept. And like really fucking cool special effects. Really, really cool special effects. Combination of like um you know, puppetry and there's like shots from like basket case whatever the fuck his name is, basket cases uh, <laughs> perspective and like they use like gloves for his hands and stuff like that and they use like prosthetics or whatever. And there's also stop motion in the film because there's a bit where like uh, basket case gets out of his basket and like starts walking around the room and they use stop motion for that oh, and so like cool. he throws stuff around and it looks really cool mm. like it, it's it's kind of bad so it's not intentionally like, a, like it's low budget like this is a lot like this Camp. thing this thing costs like 50 grand or something like, that. like this is a yeah, very low five thousand dollars yeah man. super low budget film but like it's charming as shit like it's so much fun to watch like basket case like the character is just crazy and his weird brother coming walking around carrying him and like all the characters are like they all have like this weird like unique trait about them where like one fella um he's like the owner of uh of the hotel they're staying in and like just him running up and down the stairs and just like yelling at every one of every one of his uh you know um staff not staff the people that are staying as guests, yeah, as guests and stuff like that, just like roaring at them and stuff like that. It's just funny, um. But then, what happens is that the main character, not basket case, basket Keith, let's call him Keith. <laughs> Keith like has a has a relationship with this girl, um. When he kisses her at one stage, and basket case is like you know in his basket back home, <laughs> uh, they're still like connected, like as uh, mentally, yeah. mentally. So basket case hears this and starts losing it. And then it eventually develops into the point where the brother's like lying down in bed and he's having this dream and he's dreaming about the girl and he's dreaming about like touching the girl and like having sex with her. But then it's then it twists and it's actually basket case is doing that. Oh. And it's not a dream. Oh. And he's actually he's actually raping her. He's raping her. What the fuck? And what? he kills her. And wait, how? He kills her, but he, like, strangles her afterwards. Yeah, but, like, how is he... I don't know. Like, how does he get to actually know. doing it? It's never explained. Oh, no, he, like, he escapes. He escapes and just finds her. He finds her, yeah. 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 Well, they could have done it in a better way, you know? They really could have, man. It really, like, like yeah. the film ended... That doesn't really make any sense. The film ended on a downer. I was like, ah... Oh, is this that is the just, end of the film? Like, that's basically the end of the film. Because so then, uh, then the then Basque case comes back, and the two of them fight, and they fall out the window. They fight. And they <laughs> die. They both die. They both die. But there's basket case two and basket case three. Yeah. And these two dudes are in every single one of them, so they don't die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's just the seventies, isn't it? They, the yeah, 80s. It's, just, it's like B movie shock shite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They need someone to be like, oh my god, why? But there's never, there's never a why. There's no answer to the why. It's just like just to wind you up. Basically. It's the same thing as um. Sleepaway Camp. Yes, mm. that's the exactly what the same year. It's the same year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just doing something shocking at the end of it. Yeah, I was like, "Are oh, you gonna ruin the entire <laughs> film from doing that?" <laughs> yeah, like, why? <laughs> yeah, why did you do that? Because like, he could do anything else. Really. It could have just been fun the entire way through. Or you could just have a murderer, you know, in some different way. Yeah. Or murder someone else. Yeah, or just yeah, or like have, just like, have like, him just have yeah. him go rogue and like yeah. try to kill his brother. You know. Well, the, no, no, literally, just have him murder her. You don't have to have him rape her. You yeah, murder her. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just the eighties. Different time. It really, is a different time. <laughs> yeah. Different vibes. Yeah. We'll go for a quick break before. Aye. 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 We are back. And we are ready to talk about our recommended film of the two weeks. The assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. 2007 film. Kind of neglected. Kind Andrew, of forgotten. Kind of forgotten. Kind of bombed on its release. People mm-hmm. did not like it. Uh, but it's one of those films that, you know, will stick around. It was a victim of its circumstances. It really was. You know? Because I looked this up after watching it. I was like, what the fuck? This must have won awards. Like, this had to have won Oscars. And I went on to the IMDb page. 
nominated for two. Mm. And then I was like, what the fuck won that year? No Country for Old Men. I was like, yeah, ah. Yeah, because kind of a Western yeah. kind of thing. It's like, because this is a very much, like, No Country for Old Men is kind of like a weird, different kind of thing, different kind of Western. It's not mm-hmm. even set during that time. More of a modern take on it. Whereas this is very much like an anti-Western, like a revisionist Western. It's this is anti-mythos of the Western. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a complete response to the genre. You know, the whole Western genre being like a, you know, historically being like kind of like the the uh, ideological scaffolding of, of the American project, you know, yeah. that whole thing. Like that was huge, like early 20th century cinema dominated by that genre. Oh, John massively. Wayne. massively. Jesus. All the boys, the That's searchers. Like, that's what early American, like, um, early Hollywood is known for, is, like, the Western. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There's so many. And there's the Western ridiculous amounts. died. <laughs> it died of death, yeah, in, like, the 50s, 60s, around about the 60s. Things just kind of switched gear, you know, and it moved into a different phase. But the whole, the, the relationship that audiences had with the Western, not just in America, but, like, everywhere else. It's touched on the film, because it is about Jesse James, the most, you know, probably the most famous outlaw, Western outlaw, mm-hmm. uh Ever, you know, everyone oh, knows Jesse yeah. James. Yeah, uh, you know the you know the name. Like everyone knows Jesse James. Yeah, read the uh, little synopsis here. Robert Ford, who's idolized Jesse James since childhood, tries hard to to join the reforming gang of the Missouri outlaw, but gradually becomes resentful of the bandit leader. And that's pretty much it. Well, the title explains a lot of it as well. The the title explains in an the ironic end of the way. Movie. Yeah, yeah. It's like the title is a. It's kind of like a play because the like the real message of the film or how the film really plays out is a reversal of it's more the the assassination of Robert Ford by the coward Jesse James than anything else. Well, you well, cause, like even in the terms of like the idea of like the western, like you hear the assassination of Jesse James and it's like oh gunfights, yeah, gunfights yeah. the entire way through or like something like that, like like it it throws back to like. You know the old kind of westerns, like some of the. T- I can't. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but like the good, the bad, and the ugly. For one, there's literally like shots of like the good, the bad, and the ugly, and these. Yeah, like, yeah. That's the three characters, mm. and you're gonna follow these three, but like the assassination of Jesse James. It's a, it is about that, but it's about so much more than that. It's about like what that represented to people and how rela- how people related to even the idea of. Jesse James being assassinated by the coward Robert Ford, like that's yeah. like you know what I mean. Like it's it it the, brings the up it brings up an an idea of what the film is going to be immediately from the title, mm. and it like plays with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's the, the whole thing. The film is like kind of dancing, dancing with that idea of a of a mythos of a, of a mythology. Because that's you know Jesse James, who's a real guy, very much a real person, and. Um, who was famous during his lifetime, which is a big thing in this, uh, because Robert Ford basically approaches him. Like Robert Ford's a real guy as well. It's like all based on completely true events. Very, mm-hmm. very accurate film. It's a historical drama, really, a period piece. Um, but the whole like Robert Ford saw Jesse James out because he knew him from the dime novels, like the like the mm-hmm. like the basically the comic books of the day. He was like a superhero, pretty much, like the an early American superhero. He was a Robin Hood figure. Yeah, and he had, but he like Jesse James was a real person. Uh but like this film is kind of about how he wasn't, like the Jesse James of legend is not, wasn't the real Jesse James. Yeah, he's just a man. Completely different kind of. Uh, As Robert Ford says, like towards the end of the film, he's just like I like when he's when he's staying to his brother. Yeah, we're gonna kill him. And he's just like he was yeah. like, are you sure we can do this? And then he just like looks behind. He's like, he's just a man. Yeah, he slowly he yeah. slowly kind of breaks down because he, he starts out idolizing this this figure as like really childlike kind of way, but by the end like as the oh film, man, it's pathetic. Yeah, yeah, but it's like it's it's really endearing as well. It's just like this guy, it's just a kid because he he was nineteen. He or I think he was twenty when he when he did it. But, but he, he was, was nineteen. He was nineteen when he 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 first joined the gang. He's just a kid basically, and uh, but as as he gets to know Jesse, he just re- he, things start to break down, and as the film progresses. Uh, the legend just kind of falls apart, like before your eyes. Like, mm-hmm. but it's all pretty much shot from Ro- Robert Ford's perspective. Even scenes where he's not in it, it's kind of stuff that he's already been told, or he's been he's he's told about later. Yeah, but it's basically uh, like the dissection of the legend and like sort of the the breakdown of of the reality of the the truth of it. Mm-hmm. So sort of the um, deconstruction of the genre, mm-hmm. a total annihilation of the genre, pretty much. Like yeah. this this finished. 
the, the Western genre, pretty much. Like, yeah. About 50 years too late, but like this is like the perfect anti-Western for me. It's one of my favorite films. Same. Like, ever. After watching it last night. Yeah. I hadn't seen it in so many years. I, um, oh, it's so fucking good. So good. Very long film, but long in like a really deliberate, a deliberate way that really keeps you going. It's like a trance kind of mm-hmm. thing. It's amazingly well shot. Oh, it's fucking beautiful, man. It's so I know that I am raging now because we d- I didn't couldn't give this as my answer to like what's the best shot film you or like what's like a perfectly shot film or something like that mm. whatever that question was like a few episodes back this would be my answer this is stunning yeah oh so my good. god oh the man. landscapes no the landscape the use of light the yeah. use of like just movement in the camera and like like it has that days of heaven thing that we talked about like two weeks ago now using the you know the wheat fields and being shot like, you know, golden hour and the the sky is stunning and like the backdrop and the shadows of Jesse James contrasted with it. It's amazing, man. Yeah, everything about it. Yeah, Andrew Dominic. He, like, he's not a huge name, but he did this. He's done a few other things. He did uh, Killing Them Softly, which I've seen, which is another film that like hated, well, like that film was hated at the time mm. when it came out. But looking back on it, it's like it's no. This is a good film, and it's talking about something. Yeah, yeah. This guy just doesn't have the right look, yeah. you know. I I, I saw Mark Kermode said this was a uh, when it first came out. He's w- the one of the ones who like sort of predicted that it would it would sort of uh, improve with time. He said said it was going to be like one of the forgotten classics, or like it'd be something you look up, look back on in a hundred years time. Yeah. And be like this is like this sort it's of our peeping tom. Yeah, yeah. This like defined the 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 decade, but we just didn't see it at the time. Yeah, I think it's kind of like that, you know. It's just really one of those. Uh, I can't remember where I first heard of it, but it's just one of those incredible films that uh, I, I'd somehow forgotten. And I was just like, I was thinking about it. I think th- three, two or three weeks ago. I was like, oh, let's let's recommend this. Mm. Let's watch this. Sit down and watch this. You know, I was I was thinking maybe a bit, it'd be a bit long or a bit boring. But we did Tokyo Story, so it was we fine. Did, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Because that's I think that's what turned me on to. We've broken the camel's back now at this stage. Yeah. Any any length is a go now. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Well, I I thought that and I watched First Cow and I'm like, man, this is only two hours long. But that that that's the thing with First Cow. Well, First Cow is also a western, but set earlier. Like the assassination of Jesse James happened in 1882, so this is this is very much towards the the end of the. Uh, the old west kind mm-hmm. of period which is basically the subject of the film uh, first cow is 1820s but like i watched first cow after this and uh, it was just like such a dramatic change of pace they're both very very slow films but there's something else about the pace like i think pacing pace, i think pace is completely key. completely independent of like how long a film is yeah because this this film is like extremely well paced and like you ne- you never feel bored no. There's so much going on, man. I wouldn't say because like I took a, I did, I did have to take a break with because it, it is very slow. Like it is very slow. Yeah, yeah. But I had to take a break, and I was like, I was like, ah, I'm gonna take a break now. And I clicked and I hit pause, and like, Jesus, I'm an hour in. What the fuck? Because mm. uh, I, I was expecting it to be like, because like I, I know that this film is really fucking slow. I was expecting it to be like 30 minutes in, but no, it was like mm. it was an hour in. Yeah, it's two hours 40, but it flies in. Mm. It flies in, you know, because it's straight into it with Bob and the boys. It starts out with just like the, the talking over like shots of the landscape and just describing who Jesse James, you know, is, mm. and then it cuts to Robert Ford coming into the, into the camp and just like staring at Jesse James and like, yeah, you know, smirking and smiling or whatever. And like again, I think that has to do with as because well, when I was watching it, knew n- literally nothing about the film. I didn't know anything about, uh. The assassination of Jesse James, or even the character, or the man himself, knew nothing about. So I'm going into this, and I'm seeing like, oh, I'm like, oh, that's Robert Ford. Okay. Oh, he's gonna. He was like, oh, shit, he's gonna kill him now. I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, there's no context for what's going on. And then realizing, oh no, he he idolizes him, mm. and it just like shifts your your expectations shift, and like, oh, this is like a tragedy, because now you know that the whole film is gonna be like a slow decline to what's. What what is inevitably gonna happen? Yeah, yeah. The ending is given away in the title, like you know, mm-hmm. that's pretty much the end. Well, like there's another ending as well, like, sort of after. It's like half an hour at the end after yeah. that happens. But um, but yeah, like you're you're just brought into this world where Jesse James is already an established character. Like, it's coming towards the end of his reign, pretty much. Like he's pretty old by the time this happens. He's in his his, his early thirty. Well, not pretty old. He's in his early thirties. For, for, for back then, pretty much. For an outlaw, for for an outlaw, he's pretty. He's old, you know. 
uh, and he's already famous. He's already like he's the so, he's he's the stuff of legends in America. It's mentioned in the film in different lines that he's like the most famous American outside like Abe Lincoln and stuff like that. Mm. Like even uh, people in Europe and like uh, Asia know who he is. Yeah, and that that's how famous he was. Like while he was he was only he was in his thirties, and people across the globe knew who he was at a time when you know it took like a week to send a letter from yeah. one country to another. You know, it was insane how famous this guy was. How much he captured captured the public imagination, um, even though a lot of it wasn't true, mm-hmm. like uh, uh, most of it, pretty much all of it wasn't true. Yeah, all of it was bollocks. Yeah, absolute bullshit. But it's because he, because in reality, he was mates with the editor that made the, the dime, books, the dime novels. Yeah, the dime yeah. novels uh-huh. and all that stuff. Like he was mates with them, and he like created this mythos about basically his mate. Yeah, yeah, and like. Because when you hear about the stories and stuff like that, you're just like, oh, he's just like an outlaw, like a bandit. But like, that's only because I don't know what they said in in the, in the dime novels. And then you hear about like some because the film gives hints, or like not even hints, like it blatantly says at some points like what people said or thought that Jesse James was it's like, oh, like you can never creep up on him and stuff like that. Like he yeah. can always hear you. Like he's always hyper aware. He always has his guns with him, which is true. Like he always did have his guns with him. But mm. the film really plays into the fact, like, this dude is an out and out outlaw and, like, a kind of, like, godlike figure in the film, nearly. And that's torn down, like, yeah. scene from scene to scene to scene. Because you see it from Bob's perspective. So all this, like, he, he arrives at the camp and he's like, this is Jesse fucking James. And he's talking to Frank James at first because it was a, the James Younger gang is what they were. Um, and so it's the two brothers. They're kind of the leaders of it. And this all happened in like the aftermath of the the American Civil War. The James brothers had been like uh, partisans; they've been bushwhackers in the uh, the kind of the Nebraska. I think it was in the Nebraska sort of Kansas border territory mm-hmm. areas. Even in the pre- the prelude to the Civil War, they're just kind of like uh, paramilitaries that went around terrorizing Union towns and like abolitionists and stuff like that. Um, for, like from from the age of like sixteen, like from like from the time they were boys, they were killing grown men yeah. and other boys there's like a there's one example where they went to at least frank james was at the lawrence massacre which was a uh, something that was carried out by uh william quantrill and his his whole kind of gang they went into a town and massacred 200 uh basically all the men of age of fighting age mm-hmm. in the town because it was a union town as it was an abolitionist town yeah and they went in there just to like wipe out the voting population which was like you know men over a certain age like landholders and stuff like that so that they could manipulate the demographics basically gerrymander the the district so that slavery could be permitted within mm-hmm. this territory because uh, i think it was kansas or one of those states had just been incorporated at the time and turned into a territory uh so the Jameses were part of that and then james went off with some other guy the bloody bill anderson was even worse complete mm-hmm. psychopath absolute sadistic evil little man <laughs> and then they did a he ended up dying. He died at twenty three, which is another thing. All these great sort of outlaw Confederate heroes died in like their early twenties. Yeah, they died yeah. mad young. Yeah, heroic kind of like legendary deaths, like in battle and stuff like that. Um, uh, th- there's another massacre they did in Centralia, the Centralia massacre, where they they derailed the Union train and and massacred everyone on board, and the Jameses were part of that as well. Like they're just they're absolute animals, yeah. you know. But they like this is this this takes place nearly twenty years after that. Mm-hmm. Or ten years after that, so like they're not, you know, they're kind of past their prime, and like the the war is over, and the South is lost, and like the the government is kind of closing in on them. Mm-hmm. Like they are, they are, they're always operating in the film in like the trees, in the forests. They're just kind of like living on the edges. It's not even really a frontier anymore, because it's like it's all being incorporated. Yeah, they're in weed fields. Yeah, yeah, it's like like things like it's basically over. Like the the story of Jesse James is pretty much over when the film begins. Like the yeah. the legend himself. It's literally the last train robbery that it starts with. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like the, there's this amazing shot oh. at, the st- at the start of the train robbery where it's just Jesse standing like on a he has like a a, p- a pile of like uh, logs on the track to stop the train so they can like rob or whatever. And just this amazing kind of like glorifying image of the the light from the train just sort of casting this silhouette of Jesse James. He's like he has like the waist or the the trench coat. Ass, he has man. the hat. Yeah, he's like standing with his hands on his hips. And the train stops in front of him. Yeah, and like you're thinking, if you're think if you're going into this blind, you're thinking, oh, this is gonna be a class kind of like badass shoot him up kind of thing, mm. and like he's gonna be a Robin Hood kind of character. But once you get onto the train, 
it's it's like the violence becomes real. Yeah, it's like it's really cramped, and like the violence is just like it's like it's kind of disgusting because like they they don't. It's not like they're robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. They're just terrorizing random people yeah. on the train, uh, like random like uh, like clerks, like random employees. Uh, this film is employees. extremely intense. Yeah, yeah. The, like he just he he beats up random people and like brutalizes them for no. Even the members of his gang are like mm. stop. Yeah, like, that's like what are you doing? He, you, you, like, don't you don't kill him. You don't kill. You don't have to kill him. Yeah, and Je- but Jesse James is just like an animal. Like he's just he was not a nice. He was a yeah. murderer and like a bandit. And it's made clear, like, the, the train scene is a perfect kind of, like, microcosm of the film. Because it starts out with that amazing, glorifying, aesthetic, mm-hmm. romantic kind of vision of him. And but then as soon as you get inside, it's, it's just hell, like. But even, like, it is, even the shot beforehand, like, before it cuts to Jesse's silhouette, like, the train's coming, and it's, like, pitch black, and you see the train coming slowly. And then, it, like, there's shots of um of the trees, and you're seeing, like, you know, uh, the the gang in the trees waiting. But, like, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but for me, it immediately looked like KKK members. And that immediately was, like, it, like had me, like, with a, a sinister image in my head and the tone of that scene, I was, like, there's, like, an underlining, like, evil Because they're wearing the masks. Because they're wearing the masks, mm. and it looks like, like you know, KKK. Oh, yeah. Well, they're basically the precursor to all that's that That's the stuff, thing, yeah. as well. Because that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, yeah, shit, these are all Confederates, as well. Yeah, they're all, like, ex-Confederates. Like, Jesse James, his family were slaveholders. Um, his stepdad was, anyway. And he fought for the Confederacy, like, with the aim of allowing, of, like, legalizing slavery in, in the, the newly incorporated territories, and for, like, defeating the Union. Mm. And that was the whole thing, where, like, the myth... That kind of built up around them, because like after the Civil War in America, they had like this kind of thing where, like they, they couldn't, the Union couldn't afford to destroy the South mm-hmm. because it was like half the country, so there had to be like a kind of meeting of the two, like a compromise. So they had this myth of like, uh, like the the betrayed, like you know, like the, the lost cause kind of thing, yeah. where like the South was just kind of betrayed by a few, uh, by a conspiracy or whatever, mm-hmm. or like uh, it's like the South shall rise again, all this stuff. Yeah. And Jesse James was a huge part of that because he was an, he was a Confederate who fought for slavery, but at the same time he was this all American hero who was like a, like superhuman, and he was like he was America personified. Yeah, even though he was like, you know, not what you'd want America yeah. to represent. He was like he was literally the idea, the idolized version of the South winning the war. Yeah, exactly. Because he yeah. always because like the idea was as well as like oh yeah, he's only targeting. Uh, you know, northerners. He's only attacking those, and he doesn't even kill the people. He's just taking the money and stuff like that. But that wasn't even true. Like, there's multiple accounts where he just like killed someone for literally no fucking reason. Yeah, he didn't even distinguish between like uh, like southern sympathies and like like there's nothing political to what he and did. And they say that in the film as well. Yeah, he just they killed he just killed random people. There's like there's the, he never ever considered someone's political allegiance when he was killing them. He's just fucking killing them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's like that's even the thing in the western genre as well. I was reading about how at the start of uh, the dawn of cinema, in, like the early 20th century, it obviously dominated by westerns, but you also had a, like a, a subgenre of that, which was like Civil War films, and they were mainly set in the East, mm. like the the Union kind of part of the country, and then you had the westerns, which were more stuff like Jesse James, where it'd be like, oh, the South shall rise again, all this stuff, uh, but like over time, it kind of met in the middle, where you have this kind of this like intermarriage, where you have like like the trope of like the Southern Belle and like the rough kind of. Uh, yeah, the rough union kind of uh, blow in or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and the whole like the like just kind of sh- goes to show like the ideological thrust behind the Western genre, mm-hmm. like what it's what the, what what purpose it served to kind of unite this nation of like completely, you know, divided people, people who didn't get along. Like I've never really get, gotten along. Still I wish, don't. I wish I don't like don't really have anything in common besides the fact that they're all in like the same kind of landmass. Mm-hmm. It's like just this kind of uh, this weird kind of. Uh, use that it had and this film is just all about poking the holes and all that all mm-hmm. that, that kind of uh, that, that phenomenon but um, yeah that train scene is something else though oh it's uh, it's insane yeah, yeah but that was a moment as well where like it, as you said like the violence like shifts and it gets way more like all the all the violence in the film is abrupt and like mm. quick yeah unpleasant and unpleasant mm. and like because when he's especially when he's hitting that kid like when he's hitting the kid and like holds his ear and he's like, I could peel this off like paper and smacking him and he's like, he's like, where's where's Andy or something like that? Whatever the fuck he's saying to him. And then again, like your your man's like, Jesse, get the fuck off him. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not even that like they're saying, oh, 
like Jesse James. He wasn't like this at all. He was actually really bad. It's like it's more like Jesse James is just a random guy. Mm-hmm. He was just he was just some ra- he was like completely average, which is something that Bob really uh, sort of dramatically comes around to this realization that he has, and it kind of peaks when he starts standing up to to Jesse James. Which is after he's killed someone, and he's got like he's like, oh, I'm yeah. fucking, I'm like Jesse James now. Yeah, yeah, but he just realizes that like there's nothing. He's not he's not very smart. Like he's like he's really rash. He doesn't. He doesn't really. Pl- he doesn't really he's plan. Paranoid as well. Really paranoid, like all the time, which is understandable. Like he doesn't really plan his robberies or like any anything that he does. And even when, um, even when he first joins, he's talking to Frank James after the robbery, and Frank James is just like, "Yeah, this is the last thing we'll ever. This is our last mm-hmm. ever robbery." Like they're planning to just cash out and fuck off somewhere else. But like there's there's nothing noble about it. There's no like wider project or wider goal. They're just in it for the cash, and then they're fucking off. Like, sure, as man says, like, what do you? He's like, uh. Sam Rockwell says to Frank, Frank James, yeah. "It's like, what are you, what are you gonna do?" And he's like, "I think I might open up a shoes, a shoe shop." Yeah, yeah, and just, like, cuts. just yeah, just go. They just fade into normality. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing, and that's the kind of conflict that Jesse runs into as well, because he's he realizes that Bob is like sees him as something else. Mm-hmm. Jesse's aware of the fact that he isn't really the person that Bob thinks he is, and that Jesse James, the legend, the person from the dime novels, uh jesse james himself are two different people really oh uh, and like it's creepy as well when he yeah. when he starts it's like you know how i knew you were jesse james i wrote out a few things to like differentiate the two of you and he's like do you want to hear it and he's like yeah sure and he's just listing off like jesse james in this like really creepy like specific way where he's just like he's got blue eyes that can dart through anything and stuff like that or whatever yeah but like it's also super homoerotic <laughs> Oh, he's definitely he's definitely gay for Jesse. Yeah. But it's, it's it's like he's just he's like meeting like Iron Man or something. Yeah, you know? he's like he's just a fan of him, but he's a fan of a character that doesn't exist. Mm. Like Jesse's just Jesse James, the man he meets, is not who he thinks he is. He's just he's just like he's a ghost. He's like he's someone whose image precedes himself. You mm-hmm. know, so he's he's like kind of like the, the man himself is caught up in that kind of thing, where, you know, he's just going about his business, but he realizes that he's part of a myth. And like he 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 loves the fame as well. He's always talking about, you know, like embracing the fact that he's he's uh, so notorious. Mm. But over time, he comes to realize that he's sort of he's subject to this this myth as much as Bob. Yeah, like they're kind of tied into it, which is the whole thing. He kind he kind of encourage. It's kind of a ritual suicide at the end of the day. Ah, uh, yeah. He encourages Bob to kill him which is what happened in real life he's like Bob you can be the guy that killed Jesse James yeah he builds him up he doesn't like Bob at all he finds him really creepy which is really as understandable as do we <laughs> as everyone who watches the film yeah he's a very strange guy but he builds him up and purposely kind of like as things because kind of, there's uh, they're on the run for a while and it's just him and the four brothers mm. and you can tell that things are kind of closing in and th- things are really winding down like as we said like at the start it's base. It's already the end of Jesse James's story. It's the end of the West, but you can tell as they're on the run that they're like sleeping, like he's mad power at night and like oh, a- any movement he yeah. jumps up and he cocks his gun. In his head, he's thinking like, "It's just there's no at, at, any, at any moment I'm dead." Yeah, at any moment I'm dead, but there's no way out of this in like a a respectable kind mm-hmm. of like Southern way and like go down fighting. Like he like he can't be like Jesse James can't have gone down quietly like, mm. or else he would have ruined the myth. And like the myth is kind of greater than the man himself, so he had to go down in like a, a kind poetic of, way, yeah, a dramatic way, yeah, which is what he orchestrated at the end, or like half an hour before the end of the film. Very creepy scene as well. It is very really sad. Very, very sad. And the music, the music, we're, we're man, like Nick Cave, Nick Cave. Like we're listening to the soundtrack as we're talking about this film right now. So good. The audience might not be able to hear this because we don't get too heavy a copyright claim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like the music in this film is phenomenal. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so nice. It's one of my fa- easily one of my favorite soundtracks to a film. Mm, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis, very ambient. You mm. know, it really sticks with you. Oh, it seriously does. You know, there's and like there's like the, the song for Bob. I have that saved in my Spotify. That's always stuck mm-hmm. with me. Like I, that's always in my head. Yeah. Like I watched this. I don't know, like twenty fourteen, twenty fifteen. Even this always song, stayed with me. This song that we're listening to now, what must be done? Beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah, a gorgeous yeah. song. It's amazing. And it's so somber. And like, ah, like just the music is so good. And the recurring theme, a uh, song for Jesse is so good as well. Just like really distinct, really recognizable music. 
Yeah, but it, like it, it fits. It fits so well with the. For, I don't, it just fits with the film. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's just like it fits like a glove. Just the Western kind of setting. The like aesthetics the, like of the, the shots and, all, and like the aesthetics of the music yeah. match each other perfectly, perfectly yeah. to create this synthesis. It's a synthesis. It's and so good. And just again, it's shot beautifully. Oh my god! Yeah. And like the sequences of it showing, like even uh, the flashback kind of shots where like we're seeing what Jesse James kind of was and he's like faded in like this kind of obscurity and like seen as this like noble figure but that being broken down and even like that idea being expanded further to where like the West wasn't what people remember it as being mm. and like your history is constructed and your history is created from the people around you and what everyone believes in and this film is like completely anti that. That's like this film is showing like, like the 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 history that you're taught isn't a reality. Yeah, it's a, a lot of myth involved. Mm. Yeah, and plus it's like, like Bob Ford, pure victim of history. You know, both in the title of this film, like in a really subconscious yeah. way, but in general sense, but also in the sense of the time that he was born in. Like, there's nothing really differentiating Bob at the end of the day from Jesse, except for the fact that Jesse is about ten years older. Mm-hmm. You know, like Bob could have been born 10 years before and he would have grown up with the same things. He would have been Quantrill's gang. He would have rode with Bloody Bill Anderson, all the boys. He would have been in the younger gang. Uh, he could have been a legend. He could have been, you know, he could have been a contender or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but he wasn't. He was born at the tail end of this of this moment in history when the people around him, like his society was kind of in a decline. It was like in retreat at least, Yeah. you know. And like Jesse James himself is just a product of his environment, of, of his time. Um, not in like a you know like a moral way, but in the sense of like there's always going to be someone like him. If it w- if it wasn't him, it would have been someone else. Yeah. Uh, and Bob, if Bob Ford as well, could have been anyone. If it wasn't him, it would have been someone else. Just roles that you have to play, like pure victim, pure accident, pure like look of the draw. Mm-hmm. Just just the way history works, you know. Like there's nothing they could they could have stopped after like the war ended, the South lost, and this is like the aftermath. Mm-hmm. You know, this is like kind of. It's like, oh, let's fucking, you know... Someone has thro- to kill the hero. Yeah, throw the towel in. You're like, we have to have a, a heroic yeah. end to this, yeah. And even, like, that scene where he... Like, the tension in the film is amazing. I think, mm. the, like, the dialogue is Casey, so... Casey Affleck. Ah, My just goodness. About the, we, My goodness. I don't know. The acting in this film yeah. is perfection. Like, I said this before the podcast to you, but, like, I've seen Manchester by the Sea ages ago. I need to rewatch it because I don't really remember that much... Um, especially because like I'd heard like oh my god the acting in it is amazing and when I saw it I was like yeah I mean I don't know I didn't really I wasn't really blown away by it and especially I was like ah oh, yeah Casey Affleck like whatever and then you know Casey Affleck is is Casey Affleck now like yeah when I when I brand, yeah. like he he you know he's he's the allegations are like like tied to him and wait the allegations yeah do you know like no, I didn't hear oh that. Casey Affleck is a piece of shit but like knowing that about Casey Affleck now adds to this because it adds to the fact that like he's like well for, like when I was watching like Casey Affleck cunt piece of shit and then seeing him play this like sad pathetic character added to it and it also helps that like He's amazing in this film. Like, fuck him. So good. But he's amazing in this movie. He's so good. And Brad Pitt is equally amazing. Brad Pitt is class. Yeah, he didn't have to go this hard. You know, A-list, 2007. Mm. He's already, he's got a massive back catalogue. He can live off the road his rest of his life. He's in Friends. <laughs> he's in Friends. He's in Friends. But he decided to make this. He produced it. And he insisted on the name, that the name stayed the, chi- stayed the same. Um... Which is obviously like really cumbersome. Probably contributed to like the fact that no one saw this film because the name is so long. But he's amazing. He's so good in this. Ah, oh, he's you cr- know he's crazy good. Yeah, it's like just like the the way he like shifts from like different registers, like and the the emotion. Like Casey Affleck is so good with like the, the subtlety of expression. So like I found him extremely unlikable. Yeah, he is unlikable. You know, but like, that's the point. I didn't realize that when I first watched it. I was like, I just don't like this guy Bob Ford. You know, something about him creeps mm. me out. But that's the that's the whole thing. Like that's that's just a testament to how well Casey Affleck pulls it off. And he's also a well developed character because like 
because of how well he's acted, you understand him so so well. Yeah, because you can see what's going like the, the fucking yeah. cogs turning his head. You can see exactly. You can see the like the subtle reaction that he has, and like you know, like when when he suddenly turns on Jesse and like he kind of stands up to him because Jesse's kind of been taking the piss out of him the entire time, yeah. and like it's just like his face changes, and you know immediately like oh he's gonna stand, he's gonna say something back, and he does, mm. and it's like it causes this tension because Jesse is crazy like jesse's a fucking madman he is so fucking paranoid all the time and like even to the point where like he walks in he comes to his mate ed miller this is earlier on the film he comes to his mate ed miller's house and ed miller is paranoid because he's like oh jesse knows because of the mythos of jesse james he's like oh jesse knows that i that that i was talking to someone and because of that He's paranoid, which makes Jesse paranoid, which makes Jesse kill him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he's unpredictable, but in, like, a bad way. It's not like, oh, he's so mysterious. Like, he's just kind of incompetent and, like, really rash and, like, bloodthirsty, you know? Uh, but, yeah, as you were saying, the writing is really good as well. The writing like, the li- is amazing. Little subtleties and stuff. And there's, like, little, there's great little lines as well just sprinkled around. Like, a little philosophical kind of, like, it's like, ha- it's like half in the door. Mm. So it's just kind of suggesting things. Even Jesse has like cool turns of phrases and stuff, uh, and then even um, there's a few times where Bob, few times where Bob Ford goes to say uh, like just like stupid cliches from westerns. Mm. I can't think of them, but like he'll he'll go to start the sentence and then someone will just cut him off. Yeah, because this isn't the western. This is like uh, like that's not like what you re- what you've read in the dime novels isn't real. Mm-hmm. Like Bob, like cop on, you know this is real life. No one says that stuff in real yeah. life. You know, it's get a grip. Kind of added into that thing, you know. Cause he's so, and he's so pathetic as well. It's just like, oh, poor Bob. You know, just yeah. let him say his thing. You know, and like when he gets bullied by his brother and they pull out the fucking lunch. His, his brother, his brother, his, so his when they pull out the box and they're taking the piss at him, like I yeah, felt yeah. so bad for him. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I felt so bad for him, but like he's still unlikable because he's still like get a grip, man. And then you know when he eventually turns and he eventually kills uh, Jesse James. That scene is forever in my mind after watching it like i was glued to the tv when i watched it um like the the music the way it's shot the acting in it and like just like everything you've been watching this film for fucking two hours waiting for this moment like the title has told you this moment is coming and you've waited like two very slow long hours for it and it pays off and it and it does it like it is emotionally impactful, but also like stimulating for the mind because it's like this is the death this is the death of an icon mm. and the film shifts from this point, and then you see like the real point of the film is actually afterwards like after the death of Jesse James you see the story of Robert Ford and it is sad and it is lonely and it's pathetic and it's tragic because he is a victim of like history and a victim of his own hubris which was believing mm. kind of believing in the gods basically yeah. <laughs> believing that he could be part of jesse james's yeah. story rather than just being a side character like like an incidental not even kind of thing a, not even a story like jesse james to be jesse james yeah like yeah. he wanted to be jesse james i don't know about like the actual figure but in the film he wanted to be jesse james mm. like and i was i was watching a, f- uh, a video afterwards and I, I never noticed this um, in the film. Like Jesse, we- or like uh, Jesse's always wearing black and white, and Robert Ford is always wearing like earthly colors to like kind of give him this kind of warmth or whatever. After he kills Jesse, he starts wearing black and white, and he starts wearing a similar hat. Yeah, yeah. As uh, Jesse James he smoking did. cigars, and like he tries to become like he wanted to be the man that killed Jesse James. Yeah. But he doesn't realize that people, you know, that, that that's it's completely different. It's like out of his control. Mm-hmm. Like he can't, he can't just, in, he can't just walk into the story. You know, it's a story. It's a mm-hmm. myth, and he's not in control of it. He, he, he ends up falling for Jesse's trick. Basically, gets in, abducted into Jesse's own weird fucking hyper real timeline, yeah. where Bob Ford is just like an incidental like coward. Just like just the shot him in the back. He's a fucking yeah, coward. He's a coward. Uh, pe- like people don't respond to that well because. They all have this collective idea of Jesse James, and when Bob Ford invades into that, it's just like this guy is just you know everyone hates him. They call him a murderer and stuff like that. He he went on tour like reproducing uh, 
uh, how he how he did it and stuff like that with his brother. And uh, he had to like he had to like stop after a while because people just booed. People just didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, they're like, "You're a coward. You're a murderer," and stuff like that. Because he just didn't realize that none of this was his, in his control. Like a, a, the guy was just a pure victim mm-hmm. of his of circumstance, you know. He was also a murderer at the same time, but like, yeah, he's also, he's also <laughs> kind of a bad. He, dude. Also, he also chose to do that, yeah. But yeah, it's sad, you know. It is sad, but it's also like mad, like cathartic. Like that scene is great because you're like, like as you're saying. It's the build up, like it's suggested in the title, but you're waiting two hours. And then there's a moment where they're at the kitchen table and uh Bob has tried to hide a newspaper which which is talking about how Dick Little has like surrendered to the to the police. And the whole thing is that Bob has like made a deal uh with the police as well and uh sort of like he's tracking Jesse. Yeah, and, and it's th- the that plan is to kill him. And Jesse's like, This is something that you should have known. Yeah. Like you obviously know about this. Yeah, he's trying to hide the paper, but then Jesse finds it in the back of the coach and they're sitting at the kitchen table. And there's a cool scene there's a cool little shot where uh, he's like stirring his tea and then he just like lets go of the spoon. He's like, What's all this about? And then it's like it's it's the two four brothers and Jesse standing in the parlor. And there's a moment where the, the music just starts. It's like the, the piano just mm. there's like a little splash of music and you're just like, This is it. Like this is what it's all been leading mm-hmm. up to. And it's like it's so well, it's and so it's cathartic. Sad. It's it's sad, but it's like it's also like oh yeah, yeah. you know this is great, you know great, oh, great yeah. it's a, a great, great movie, like great fucking film. Yeah, yeah. Like, like this is this is what it's about. This is like a classic. This is a modern classic. When people say that this is one of the best films of the twenty first century, I can see, I I can see why people will claim that. I think this film will go down as a classic, like as a forgotten classic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But one that people are like, have you seen that film, The Assassination of Jesse James by the by the coward <laughs> Robert Ford? The other person just stopped listening halfway through the. Like, yeah, <laughs> the assassination. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's so good, very very good. Nick Cave, Nick Cave, what a king! Ah, uh, music, like, such such like a combination, such like a great kind of uh, coming together of, of elements. Mm-hmm. Great acting, great shooting, great music. You know, great mythology behind it. Because it, 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 like the film itself is adding to the mythology, yeah, in a really cool way. Really yeah, it's kind of like way. really grounding it into a form of reality. Yeah, yeah, kind of like capping it, putting a little capstone on it, like goodbye, Jesse. You know, see you, Jesse. Remember you as you were. Yeah, yeah. A fucking piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy is literally like nothing redeemable about him, but he's still, you know, everyone knows him. Mm. Everyone knows him, and it's even even knowing that as well. When you're watching the film, like when he dies, it is still sad. You're just like, it's like because he was just a guy. Because he was day. just a man, and like it's like uh, he's a piece of shit, scumbag, like awful human being. Yeah, but, executed civilians, fought yeah. fought for slavery. Yeah, it's like not a good guy, but the film makes you sympathize with him because it just shows you his like his like his humanity in like a really vulnerable way. In the sense that, like, you're, but you also the, the brutality of it as well. Yeah, yeah, you have this image of him as like a fucking god, but like he's his brutal. Even his brutality is a function of like his his of his faults because mm. he's just he's just rash. Like, he's not even good at what he does. Like, there's nothing rem- really remarkable about him. He's a good leader. He's charismatic, but that's about it. Mm. You know. Now he's gone. Rip. Rip. Yeah. And then Robert Ford ends up getting killed. And mm. he's killed by a man who wants to, who want the he wanted to be the man that assassinated the coward Robert Ford. Yeah, and then someone killed him. Someone killed him. Yeah, I think I think I read that. It was like the guy who killed the man who killed Jesse James, because he he got uh, Edward O'Kelly because mm-hmm. he got pardoned after seven years because yeah. everyone was like ah here he killed he killed the coward Robert Ford. Yeah, that's I mean, not that like, shouldn't be a crime. Everyone hated him. Yeah, everyone hated Bob. Like Robert Ford was hated. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is sad. Yeah, it's sad to see in the film. <laughs> yeah, because it's like it's like an Icarus moment or something like that. Like he reached too far, he went too close to the sun, and he ended up fucking getting scorched. Got swallowed by the myth, mm. myth of the West. Yeah, because by the time he dies, it's like it's all over. Like the West is just kind of a memory. Yeah, he's almost blamed. As, like it's uh, like he's not explicitly in the film, or like you know maybe in reality, but like in a cur- in a cultural term, he's like you're one of the focus that killed the Wild West. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you ruined everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You killed Jesse James. You killed the Wild West. Yeah, it's like a watershed moment. Mm. Yeah, but like someone had to do it. It just had to be him, mm-hmm. or it just it just ended up being him. And just you just you just drew the short straw, you know. But yeah, it's, it's a proper shape. As you're saying, Shakespearean. That's a really good term for it. It's tragedy, uh, yeah. like in full. 
but so cool that like this is like that's what he did on purpose. Yeah, you know, like, like this it was is, all it's like a mi- it's yeah. a mishmash kind of thing. He did like Jesse James actually like orchestrated mm. his own assassination, which is such a cool way of like of uh, of thinking about it. Because even in because uh, I was watching when I was watching First Cow, there's a scene where uh, it's just it's Lou and Cookie, and they're just like sort of foraging around in like the the undergrowth of like the forest. And Lou just goes, "Oh, this is history hasn't arrived here yet. Like it's coming, but it's not here. This is this is like wilderness." Mm. And like, that's just the idea that I got from Jesse James in general, in the, the way that like you know the, the states or like America at the time, like that concept, especially after the Civil War, it's something that's trying to you know struggling to sort of establish uh, itself. establish itself. It's like a very self conscious about history, and about stories, and about mm. you know like the nation, like that whole sort of idea of like building a national myth and jesse james himself as like an embodiment of america like self-consciously went about perpetuating his own myth mm. and literally orchestrating the end of his own life just to, so that it could keep rolling yeah Which even is, though like because he takes because like one of the key things of his life and the film it's jesse james never shown never takes off his gun and for no reason like he's walking earlier on like just before he's he's killed he's walking up the road with his kid and Robert Ford's like, what are you doing? And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, do you think it's it's okay to have your guns out in front of the neighbors? And then Jesse James is like in the parlor with the two Ford brothers. Fucking Robert Ford, bumbling fucking mess, crying and like, just like shaking and panicking. Like in a very like subtle toned down way, but th- in a way that you're like, this is it. Like the emotions are all building up to this. And Jesse James just takes off his guns and he's like, yeah, you're right. Maybe not a good idea to have the guns out in front of the mm. in front of me. He's like, "This is like I'm calling on you. Yeah, you're yeah, you're the it, one yeah. to do it." And then he's like, "That picture looks dusty." And he gets up yeah. on top. That picture looks awful dusty. That's what he actually said. Yeah, yeah. That's all true because he did yeah. do that. Like he took off his guns in real life. Yeah. Um, which he never did, and he's like, you know, take me, do it, fucking end this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of you is gonna have to be it yeah. because it could have been. Like it equally, like in the film anyway, it equally could have uh, been Charlie. Robert Ford's brother Charlie. Mm. But then at the last moment, like Robert Ford just like you know takes the shot, or whatever. It's great how they do it as well. It could have been like a slow motion kind of thing, or like it, it turns away. But mm. it says it's just like it just shows it. It's really realistic. And it's, it's just re- snap brutal. Yeah, he's just gone. He's just suddenly gone. It's like yeah. really violent, and the music stops, and like the wife comes in and she's like howling. Mm. It's like really realistic screaming as well. It's just uh, and even the fact that like did you do this and he's like no it wasn't me like he immediately is like, like yeah. no I'm not the one that, I'm not the one that shot Jesse James yeah 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 he like, made he, me do it yeah he made me do it pretty much yeah like even even at that moment like when he when he eventually does it he's like oh, I actually I don't want to be this mm. but yeah it's, it's cool. too late it's too late you're, it's you you did late, it bro. you're the you're the man that did it yeah ah <laughs> uh, we're all Bob Ford in a way. We all are Bob Ford in the way this podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> Paro Bob. <laughs> Paro Bob. Uh, what yeah. a film, though. What an amazing film. Yeah. And just, geez, the, the shots, oh, the landscape. Stunning. Beautiful. Also, Hawkeye's good in it as well. Yeah, Jeremy Renner's in it. Yeah, and in a similar vein as well, like, Robert Ford kills him when he has his back turned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wood height. What he a name. A, he was a gee bag as well, though. Yeah, he was a scumbag. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dick Little, what a name. Dick Little. <laughs> Shout out to my brother, Dick Little. <laughs> Dick Little, that's his actual name in yeah. real life. He actually existed. You know? God bless him. Suave bastard. Will we leave it at that? We'll leave it there, we so. Go on to some listener questions. Any listener questions? Hey. If you want to ask us a question, you can hit us up on Instagram or on Twitter at paro underscore pod, or you can ask us by a or via Gmail, theparopod at gmail.com. Our first question is coming in from Liam, and Liam is asking us, what do you think has improved the most on the pod from day one on? Definitely the flow. The flow, the flow. The flow has uh, significantly improved. The flow is key to a podcast. The flow is key. See, we, we didn't know anything about this. Mm. We didn't do anything. We were pure Luddites going into back in the day, nearly a year ago now. Which yeah. were, it was we didn't know we had no experience. We never never worked with audio equipment. We never really done anything. No, we hadn't never. Any it was all theory, media production, yeah, or anything like that. Yeah, yeah literally had never recorded. 
Never, never done any like video shoots or anything like that. No, nothing. Only writing and stuff like that in college, but that was it. That's it, yeah. But you know, we made it work. But si- about six, seven months, we got the hang mm. of it. You know. Oh yeah, I mean, like at the start, Brandon, I'm pretty. We did pretty well. <laughs> oh yeah. We like did at it. the start, could have could have been a disaster. It could have been. Could have yeah. been last week. You know what I mean. <laughs> it could have been last. Yeah. See, that only happened three times, which is pretty good. That's a pretty good record. You know, mm. three out of fifty, pretty much. I'll take that. You know, if someone said to me at the start, you know, you have a 93% success rate, I'd be like, take like that. Those odds. I'll take that, <laughs> you know, or 94, whatever. Yeah, no, definitely the flow. Uh, learning the audio stuff, like... Easy. You know, audio is a load of shite, or audacity, a load of shite. Yeah, audacity's a they pain sh- to work with. They should have something better. There are, there are things that are better, but, like, you have to pay money for that. Yeah, stuff. Ableton, stuff like that. Wait, we're not making... Me- we're not producing Adobe's, an album or something. You know? Yeah, yeah, Adobe, or whatever that's called, Audition. Like, I don't need that level. Plus, know. we're not going to pay for that. Yeah. You have I to pay for all them. Yeah, you do, yeah. I mean, if eventually, if we actually, you know, started doing something, like, in terms of work that involved, you know, uh, uh, audio, audio stuff. stuff, you know, that'd be, that'd be handy to yeah, have. Yeah, if anyone wants to hire us and <laughs> subsidize <laughs> the purchase of that, we yeah. do it for that. <laughs> it's like, what experience do you have? It's like, you're listening to it right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is it. This is what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit record. Yeah, I can just about manipulate Audacity with a 94% success rate. Yeah. <laughs> Take that as so you will. I haven't <laughs> investigated any of the other settings on this thing. Too afraid to... Yeah. There's just no use. No point. You know, I think it's pretty much perfect as is. Yeah, don't fuck with it. <laughs> yeah, grand, d- like don't fuck with the formula. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would like to do more sections. I would like to start doing that. That's one thing that I think... Sections? What do you mean? You know, we can do news just now. Cause we, we, we should, yeah. You know, every two weeks we have our... We should do jokes. Joke sections. Like, you know, late late night stand-up where they do the, the warm-up? Man, that's going to bomb. <laughs> do you want to do improv right now? Man, we're already improv Do you want to do this? This is improv? already improv. Right. <laughs> right. It's not scripted, like. Okay, right. You're ready. You're right. Here we go, right. right. Here we go, right. Here's, a, here's some pr- improv. Oh, shit. I'm going to give you a prompt. Okay. You are a man coming into a shop and I am the shopkeeper. You want... You you're, you refuse to put on your mask and I'm telling you to put it on. Okay. Go. Ring, ring. It's the uh, sound of the door. Hello, sir. Can you please put on your mask? Why should I put on my mask? It's the law, sir. Says who? <laughs> <laughs> the, the government... <laughs> Nah, fuck that. Okay, yeah, maybe the joke section is a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> improv, we're not here for improv. This isn't the comedy club or whatever that's called. The laughter lounge. I want scripted jokes. You want Seinfeld? Yeah, I want Seinfeld, you know. We'll get the, yeah, we'll get more s- sound effects in there, you know. Maybe we'll have, maybe we'll put this stuff in, because uh, we have we have audio playing it right now. Mm. It's kind of adding a vibe to it, which won't reflect uh, yeah, for what the listeners hearing, yeah, yeah, because this is great for like it's like a like an after show kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're sitting there sipping like sipping wine or something. Yeah, but yeah. Have his copyright, man. I don't know. I don't copyright? Know. And who gives a rat? That's only on YouTube. Yeah, no, it is only on the YouTube. Yeah. Well, what are they gonna do? You know, I think yeah, because we're not making money off it, so I don't think it really matters. Yeah, I think they'll take it down anyway. But the others can stay up. Mm. Plus, it'd be funny anyway. Who, who watches the YouTube videos? <laughs> <laughs> it's like four people. I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's sections. I think would be news, current affairs. Have it more like you know, like discreet. You know, mm. like clear sections. Maybe talk about last movies. <laughs> yeah, I think. Man, I think we're kind of getting to the end of the, the whole. Mo- we talked about pretty much every movie. <laughs> <laughs> We've kind of finished movies. You know, have to move into something else. Well, you have to keep going until episode fifty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Episode 52. And then we'll start doing something crazy. Oh, imagine. You know, start getting, there's definitely, there's a different layer. You know, there's like that uh, that fucking iceberg meme. There's different layers <laughs> of films. Of podcasting. That, yeah, yeah, podcasting, yeah. And of films. But, like, that's the thing. People wouldn't wouldn't have seen them. You know? But we can be the people that, we can that go through the, them. Let's go through the iceberg, bro. Yeah, let's do it. A disturbing know? movie iceberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus, no, that. man. That's yeah. already your job. Yeah, we're, like. we're not doing that. We're not doing that, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. No way. But yeah, no, it's grand, yeah. It's all been going well. It's, it's good, it's good. What's our next question there? Our next question is coming in from Potty. Thank you for the question, Potty. He's asking, what's the greatest Irish film excluding Fatal Deviation? 
Uh, Fatal Deviation is a film from 1998. Uh, I didn't know this film. I didn't know this so film So, Paddy just kind of flexing on us here with his knowledge. Yeah, he's flexing his muscles. Yeah, his <laughs> Irish film knowledge. That's one of the things we need to do more. We need more representation from the lads. Yeah, we do. You know, more, more domestic we, we are stuff. failing. We're complete. We're failing our countrymen, our nation. Um, Fatal Deviation is a low-budget cult film produced and set in Trim, County Mead. I didn't know Trim was in County Mead. <laughs> uh, produced in 1998 enjoys the distinction of being Ireland's first full length martial arts film the film stars real life martial arts enthusiast James Bennett the film was conceived by James Bennett uh, had a budget of 8,000 punts which is what you want to hear you know yeah punts the punts that's how you know it's vintage um, best Irish film what do you think well see I was confused by this question because I was like okay what counts as an Irish film so I went on to, I looked up best Irish films, and I went on to the Irish Times, have a list of like the 50 best Irish yeah, films. I'm looking at it right Number now. one is <laughs> Barry Lyndon. Yeah. So does that count as an Irish film? It's shot in Ireland. So is Braveheart, though, but, but it's, not, that it's not about Ireland. Is that all that it needs? It just needs to be shot somewhere, you know? Um. Yeah. Because that, cause then, th- that then got me questions like, okay, does like um, Killing of a Sacred Deer or like The Lobster count? Yeah, they do count because they're Irish productions. Okay. They're like that's Irish money. That's that's gone on the heron or whatever, mm. or board's gone on the heron. Uh, I'd count them as Irish films, you know, because cause like that way, like, you know, like any foreign director in America, it's like that. Oh, it's it, that's still an American mm, film. But yeah. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't be like oh that's, you know that's fucking uh, Christopher Nolan. Batman Begins is a British film. It's yeah. British director. I'd say I'd say those are Irish films in a way. Yeah, they are. At Irish least films. half, you know. Yeah, um, no, because I was just wondering because like it's well, they're all set in Ireland, and they do sometimes have Irish actors. Yeah, uh, Man of Iron, little show, remember that? No, don't remember that. It's some, it's like a a fake documentary from 1934. Uh, they got this guy Robert Flaherty in. It's one of those things that De- one of those crazy concoctions that Dev came up with, where he's like trying to like improve tourism. So we got these lads in and uh, basically created like a noble savage. Oh, I do remember this documentary about the Iron Islands. Yeah, I they do like remember about that. They hunted sharks and stuff, which is real, but like all the f- all the scenes were faked. Um, I don't know. I think we watched it in history or something. Hunger, hunger, hunger is, is very show. good. Very good, great, great subject. A very Irish subject as well. Mm. I don't know if it's Irish produced though. I assume it is. See, that's the I thing. I feel like the Brits wouldn't touch that. The Brits aren't going to hear that. Yeah. But Irish Americans? That's true. Bobby Sands. When was that? 2008? Something like that, yeah. Hunger is great. Hunger is a very good film. Hunger is really good. Steve McQueen's a very good director. I need. I definitely need to rewatch 12 Years a Slave. Where has he been? He made Widows a while ago. That's 2018. Or, yeah, something like that. Never heard of it. Yeah, it didn't. It kind of. It kind of not bombed, but like. It wasn't re- it critically. A, Received well or something like that, but mm. that could also be man. That could be another Jesse James. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Wind the shakes of barley. Show. Yeah, that's a good film. Those are kind of standard ones. That's a, that's the problem with Ireland that you have like it's a lot of history stuff. A There's lot like, of history stuff. Yeah, Black Forty Seven is apparently really good. Did you see Adam and Paul on that list? That's like number eight or something. Yeah. It's what do you think about What something. do you think about Adam and Paul? I thought it was good. It's number eight actually. Yeah, yeah I, I thought it was good. I I thought, but the same thing. It's like it's like very real, like. It's not even. It's not historical, obviously, but it's like it's a very. It feels like there's like a limitation mm. with Irish films. You know, it's a very certain type of film that they make. Like it, it's 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 good. You know, very realist and sad and stuff. I did not like it when I watched it when I was younger. No, because people are like, "Oh, this is gas," and like, "This isn't funny." <laughs> oh yeah, it's not supposed to be funny. But it it's touted as a comedy. Yeah, but like it's like in an endearing way. It's like it's not like oh these stupid junkies get you know get glued to a mattress and stuff like that. <laughs> It's like <laughs> that's it's funny though, but it's like you know they they get fucked up mm. and it's sad. And it's Lenny Lenny Abrahamson. I don't know. Like this. he's he did uh, normal people and stuff like that. Oh right. He did. Uh, what about normal people? What do you think about normal people? I haven't watched them. I haven't seen it. I, to no, my I shame, I, apparently it's very good. He did. He did Frank and all that stuff. He's like he's re- Frank is great. He's sound. Lenny Lenny, Lenny Abrahamson wouldn't make a fucking exploitation film about junkies. I probably shouldn't even call them junkies, mm. but like. Addicts. Addicts, yeah. People with like drug addictions problems. He wouldn't do that. But yeah, at the same time, it's like very limited, I think, from what I remember. We should get him on. <laughs> I feel like he'd say yes. Come on, Lenny. I feel like he would. 
Um, what about uh, like Calvary? Ah, do you remember Calvary, that film? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that film I in a very that, long time. I saw that film in cinemas. Mm-hmm. I don't remember anything. That about came it, out though. the same time time as Frank, and Frank was also very good. Yeah, Calvary. I don't really remember anything about it though. Brendan Gleeson, you can always count on him. Mm. In Bruges, In Bruges is very good. Yeah. Yeah, does um, like, like Martin McDonough films would they count? Yeah, I suppose they would. But he's only an Irish director making American films. Yeah, true. Well, actually, I would count Six Shooter if that's if that can be counted. Brendan Gleeson's in that film. Six Shooter. It's very good. It's a short film. Very very good. Martin oh, McDonough. Oh, Cockamillish. Cockamillish. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> there we go. Cockamillish. That's it. Cockamillish. That's the end of I it. I can't yeah. believe it took us that long to get on <laughs> Cockamillish. Yeah, that but is. We're 50 episodes, in, or nearly in 50 episodes into this we podcast. Should, yeah, we still have we've rec- never talked about film for two weeks. Cockamillish. <laughs> Cockamillish. Yeah, that's that is sad though. That's so sad. Man, that thing is fucked. That's tragic. I think it's disturbing. Yeah, Brendan Gleeson though, you know, local lad, Fairview, mm. went to Joey's. Good guy. Um, yeah, Cock and Millish. That is a that is a stalwart. Mm. That is like the peak of our cinema. Yu Ming is that dumb? Yeah, Yu Ming as well. Yeah, <laughs> another great one. Want to do that more? You know, these little shorts. Yeah, oh, even yeah. Irish shorts, like with Irish language. Mm. You know, um, would in terms of animated films, Book of Kells, um, Wolf Walkers is done by that Irish studio. There's a few of them. Um. I oh my god the breadwinner that was one I watched a while ago that was very good mm, the breadwinner yeah mm. yeah I haven't seen any of them I don't think I haven't seen Book of Kells I think I've seen Book of Kells I, I think haven't it, seen that used to be on Sky and stuff because that was big back in the day because mm. it was like because any time any film here that is even like tangentially connected to a person who's like once in the country of Ireland gets nominated for an Oscar we're all like yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> Ooh, uh, yeah. that's us <laughs> that's for us that's for Ireland you know it's so funny. We can be better than that. But there, are, we, but even through that though, we still have like, you know, we got the likes of hunger, you know, lobster, all these yeah. weird shit that is like going really out there. Exactly. Well, that's what they should be trying to do more of. You and know, like our like lit- like in terms of literature, our history. Holy shit! Look at like a fucking, you know, uh, Beckett and shit like that. Yeah, really sh- fucking sh- out there shit. <laughs> we should be doing more of that. Yeah, mm. not just. Fucking My recommendation for next week is the play Waiting for Gatto. Uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the taping of it on YouTube. No, oh, yeah, we should play up to that. Not this not this rubbish stuff, plastic patty stuff. You know? Like mm-hmm. yeah, leaning into like Beckett, you know, Wild, Yates, all the boys. Yeah. Stuff about that, not just all this rubbish. I don't even know I don't even know what rubbish I'm talking about. But you know you know, yeah, the, film. Yeah. You know the kind of film, you know. You know, it's that famine movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a film about being, you know, Oppressed. <laughs> yeah. What about commitments? What do you think about that? I like the commitments. Great soundtrack. Mm. I like the commitments. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or like you know, I just feel like when you like, you see <laughs> like when I think about like the idea of an Irish film, I think of um, what was that one that came out recently? Jamie Dornan's in it. Ah, uh, Wild Mountain Time. Wild Mountain Time. That's what I think of. You yeah. just imagine that. That's it. Yeah. Like, what's the one with Tom Cruise in it? It's like far away place or something. Yeah. It's like far away home or some shit like that. Yeah. Yeah, something like it's that. Like, oh, Chase Myra. <laughs> yeah, like we all, we all make fun of that stuff, but at the same time, at the same time we encourage it for some reason in like a different way. Mm. You know, financially. I think. Financially, yeah. Because there's so little representation that we take bad representation. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's literally it. Yeah, there's no no investment. We need more investment. The country needs more investment. But at the same time, we need to do better as well. We need to start looking at yeah indigenous films you know domestic industry better that's just a, so i was just thinking about like when uh when there's so little like um jesus what is the word representation that you just go for like whatever like that imagine yeah. like and that's in terms of like you know our, like this is ireland having like a small fucking economy or whatever but that in terms of like you know like minority groups and stuff like that like that's the same thing for those groups it's the same thing yeah we're basically the most oppressed country in europe I'm just I have to be <laughs> sure, yeah, whatever, yeah. I'm not, I'm not gonna argue. Fine, let's just go. We with that. we are oppressed minority as Irish uh, people. Yeah, let's go. No, that's, like Mark, we <laughs> is were that talk- not what you were saying? Mark, that's not what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> we were just talking about how, like, we were talking about before the podcast on this this anti anti mask QAnon bullshit. <laughs> that's us. That's us. I've been won over by them anyway. Oh god. Some of them. 
Man, some of those videos really win me over, though. Oh, Mark, shut the fuck up. Not, not the Q&R ones, but no 9-11 stuff. Too many coincidences there. <laughs> oh, except 9-11. Yeah. But you're right. You're right. I just mean in terms of the general representation. That's the thing. That's the thing with you know, you know, the access to these kinds of things. It's just a matter of capital. Like, what's our economy's like half a trillion beans? We got half a trillion beans. That's a lot of money. Mm. It's also not really. <laughs> it's also not. But like for a country our size and like our population, that's a lot. But at the same time, a lot of that is just like Microsoft and Google and like all these lads just running up the numbers. So, like, it's just a problem of we don't have the investment coming in, you know? We're focusing on, like, oh, we need FDI, we need foreign direct investment, we need to attract all these companies from abroad. But it's all tech companies. It's all companies that, you know, that produce, like, computers and uh, software, you know. That's only because we're a tax haven. Yeah, yeah, that run the admin for, like, you know, the fucking lads in uh, D.C. and California and stuff like that. We should be looking at, you know, stuff like A24, stuff like Hmm. Paramount Pictures, stuff like Universal. You know, the people who do the real work in this world that produce films, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that we can, you know, project a, an image of ourselves to the world and then increase tourism and stuff like that. That'd be, there you go. That'd be my pitch. That's a Minister, if if we were in government... If you're going to be a tax haven, be a fun tax haven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. At least we get good films out of it. Exactly. Like, you know, the way all these countries have, like, uh, tax incentives for, for productions that shoot in, their, in certain states mm. and stuff like that. We should have that. I think we do. But we, we don't do. do. We don't do Even it enough. Even was shot uh, in the north. Mm. I don't know where. Yeah, but we have to have more of that, you know. But you know, there's like the Limerick Institute or something like that. They do loads of film stuff. I oh, do. Yeah, they work on stuff. Limerick's mad. For Limerick is where that stuff is. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, ex- like totally uninformed. Like, mm. I don't know anything about the Irish film industry really. I'm pretty sure I've heard before from Blind Boy. Anyway, Blind Boy <laughs> hyping up Limerick. Um, yeah. but like from Blind Boy I've heard like multiple times like yeah Limerick is kind of the spot the spot because they have like because f- I was looking at their courses as well for masters and stuff like that they have loads of shit loads of stuff uh, the problem will always be that London's like London's pretty much the same distance you know mm. which is like a lot bigger obviously yeah you get to London quicker than you get to Limerick yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you it's, it's like close enough anyway I like got way more investment way more jobs in that kind of industry that's always going to be a problem for us, but, you know, that's the story of the last thousand years. You know, it's, it, it, at Happens. the end of the day, the, to answer the question, it goes back to, you know, what's it called? The Norman invasion, mm. when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're way back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good Irish films, they exist. But <laughs> They're out there. We're going to find them. We're going to find them. At some point. That's our next series. Yeah. Some Irish films. We could do that. We could do that. We'd be bad. Nah. <laughs> pretty long. <laughs> Definitely not gonna do that. It's too specific, too much of an effort. Yeah. Um my recommendation for next week is the Before <coughs> Sunset trilogy. We're all three. All three. We're going for all three of them. That's four hours, man. We've talked about this many times off podcast that we really want to watch these films. That's very true. After watching, you know, two very long films in a row there. We might as well go for a trilogy. Why not? Yeah, might as well just go the whole hog. Yeah, four hours. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm Sounds up like for that. Let's do it. Let's do it. You know, uh, Richard Linklater, Eaton Hawk, Julie Delpy. Yeah, what a queen. What a queen. So, the whole trilogy, all three, before sunset. No, what are they called? Before. Before. Before during. midnight. Before sunset. Before sunrise. Yeah, the before. No, trilogy. wrong way, wrong, wrong way around. Before <laughs> sunrise, before sunset, before midnight. That's the way they go. Ah, uh, yeah, grand. So that's an instruction to the listener. Mm-hmm. Watch all three. All three. You better. Full spoilers for them. <laughs> yeah, full spoilers. <laughs> you know, as always. What happens at the end? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe they end up kissing. Ah, uh, count me out. We'll be two bros. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they'll kiss. <laughs> Who knows? Who yeah. Knows? We'll be back next week for episode 50. Whoa. Episode 50. Oh, shit. We have to do something special for that. We have to do something. God something knows mad. what we'll come up with. Who knows? Maybe there'll be well, sp- something special. Well, the listener, they're in for a special surprise next week. We can't promise it. We can't tell you what it is. We can't tell you what it is. Nor can we promise <laughs> you that it will be <laughs> different. <laughs> but we can say that something will happen. Something will happen. <laughs> <laughs> there will probably episode be an episode. Episode 50 will be out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. That's what we can guarantee you. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. God bless. God bless and goodbye. See you.